His Stand-In Holiday Girlfriend, Christmas in the City. Written by Casey Stockton. Narrated by Elizabeth Eliason. Chapter 1. Do not trip. You will not trip. You are walking in very tall heels along the brightly lit hallway in front of all your new co-workers on your very first day, Ellie, and you absolutely, positively will not fall flat on your face. Balancing two drink trays with five coffees each, one safely nestled into each compartment with a fifth precariously shoved in the center, Ellie made her way down the row of desks toward the long, clear glass boardroom, housing all seven executives and their two guests. Perhaps she should have refrained from ordering that tenth drink, but after the mayhem in the bean and the pushing and shoving she endured to get the executives and their guests the best coffee in all of San Francisco, the least they could do was buy her a tea for her troubles. And it was peppermint, which was the perfect tea for the very first day of December also known as the beginning of the Christmas season, Ellie's absolute favorite holiday. Sure, that was common, but this was different. Ellie didn't just enjoy Christmas. She really, really loved Christmas. The clear glass walls showed the meeting already in session, and Ellie slipped into the room as her boss stood at the head of the table, going over the basic description the museum had supplied when they'd approached her firm about collaborating for a charity Christmas gala. She scanned the idea boards and her stomach turned. These weren't concepts for a Christmas party. They were concepts for a high-end fashion show or a movie premiere celebration. If Ellie had the authority to decorate the gala on her own, she would successfully create a holiday party done right. Santa's workshop, maybe, or a winter wonderland. Much like her own apartment was going to look. She'd gotten the most gorgeous tinsel garland from Target on clearance the year before, and she was dying to get home from work and set it up. A hand came up and snapped in her face, jarring Ellie from her daydreams of decorating the apartment. It would have been completed already, of course, if Kayla hadn't forbid any decorations before December. It really was the worst living with a Scrooge sometimes, even if that Scrooge was her best friend. Hello? the male voice called, snapping his hand in her face once again. His salt-and-peppered hair was styled ridiculously high for an older man. He was clearly trying to make himself look younger with a hip style. Maybe someone should tell him he could shave years off his face if he dyed his hair instead. Coffee girl, he said, his voice as arrogant as his suit. Give me my cappuccino. Right, sorry. Ellie set the drink trays on the end of the glass table, spinning the cups to read their labels and pass them out accordingly. Her boss, the balding man who stood at the head of the table on the other side of the room, waited, his fists balled and resting on the glass tabletop in a gorilla stance. He wore an expression of veiled irritation, but she persisted in handing out the coffee. Why was he waiting? He could speak over her if he wished. After stepping carefully around the table and setting a cardboard to-go cup in front of Mr. Gaines, the gorilla man, Ellie hurried to the other end of the table, stacked the drink carriers, and tossed them into the trash can. Taking an unobtrusive seat in the corner at the far end of the room, Ellie cupped her tea with both hands and waited for the meeting to resume. It was her first day, and it was not going as smoothly as she'd hoped. But Mr. Gaines had told her when he'd taken her on as an intern for Harvard Allen Design that she was welcome to sit in on meetings and attend the gala preparations herself to learn. So why was he giving her such an odd look right now? He stood tall, sipping his coffee before slapping it down on the table. We've got to step it up. The last two mock-ups were both mediocre, and I think we are going entirely the wrong direction. His gaze turned sharply to the man on the far end of the table, who was evaluating the sticker on the side of his cup, which gave the details of his chosen drink. Garrison, that's you. What is going on in your department? Ellie brought her own cup to her lips and blew softly into the drinking hole. Scalding her tongue was not on her list of things to do for the day. The room really smelled like coffee. Ellie didn't love the scent, but her peppermint was helping to mask it. It almost smelled like a peppermint mocha, and that made her want her tea even more, so she blew into the hole again. Mr. Gaines didn't wait for Garrison to respond, but kept speaking. I think I adequately portray the museum's feelings when I remind everyone in the room that the museum is full of modern art. The decor for this event needs to be synonymous with the vibe of the museum. The vibes they've been feeling from your team's mock-ups are not at all modern. If I may, a man asked. He was one of the visitors from the museum's board, sitting beside a woman in a smart red suit. Her dark hair was pinned back in a flawless French twist, and her intelligent gaze meant business. The museum man continued after Mr. Gaines flicked a nod in his direction. 
Our patrons expect something new and edgy when they step through our doors. The purpose of modern art is to draw out fresh emotions. The Christmas gala needs to mirror our ideals. Mr. Gaines nodded. We want to avoid the typical classical Christmas. The female museum correspondent stood, crossing the room to point at the mock-up sitting on an easel at the front of the room. Lose the fake snow completely. We live in San Francisco. Give us a young, hot Santa with a trimmed beard. Forget the reindeer and set up a team of Great Danes. Dogs? She wanted to replace Santa's reindeer with dogs? And a trimmed beard? What was that about? Santa didn't have time for that. He was too busy checking his list. Ellie shook her head disgusted. What would this woman suggest next? Giving Santa a top knot and putting Mrs. Claus in a mini dress? Searching the table for the men's reactions to this farce, Ellie stopped short on Garrison, the head of design. He watched her curiously through narrowed blue eyes, his fingers spinning his coffee cup slowly on the frosted glass table. Everyone else seemed intent on listening to Mr. Gaines and the couple from the museum bounce ideas back and forth. But Garrison was locked on her as though he was a biologist studying a new species. And Ellie was the species. She wasn't going to let the pointed attention slide unaddressed. Bringing her cup up to salute him, Ellie took a long sip, eager for the peppermint to hit her taste buds. But peppermint wasn't all that filled her mouth. Laced with coffee and something else? Chocolate? She spat out the full mouth of liquid she'd sucked in, spraying the conference room floor and Garrison's shoes, who sat closest to her at the end of the long table. She stared wide-eyed at the mess she'd created, and the men and women in suits who watched her with expressions ranging from shock to humor. Um, she said, standing. I'll fetch something to clean that up. Tossing the coffee into the trash can, she heard Garrison say from behind her, If you want to give my drink to me... Well, never mind now. She cringed, shooting an apologetic look over her shoulder. Was that why he had stared at her? Had their drinks been switched? Pausing with the door open, she contemplated asking for her tea. She could really use it right now. But the glare from Mr. Gaines spoke volumes, and she scurried out of the room, leaving her tea behind. Well, that could have gone better. Her very first meeting on her very first day, and she completely bungled it. Sighing, she hurried through the row of desks, slipping around the corner and stopping on the glass bridge. Leaning back against the wall and looking out over the wide open space below, she wondered if a bridge made entirely of clear glass was structurally sound. There was a courtyard below with tables and a cafe, and the people looked sleek and chic and prepared to work in a grand architecturally elite building. Closing her eyes in an effort to block the horrible memory for a moment, she grunted, stomping her foot in a very undignified manner, her heel rang out against the glass. If only there was a pillow nearby she could bury her face in and scream out her frustrations. She was not making the best first impression. Spitting someone else's coffee everywhere during a meeting with one of the firm's largest clients was not a great way to start out. You okay? A voice asked, startling Ellie into opening her eyes. She looked to her left and noticed a young hipster guy leaning out of another glass conference room. His thick-rimmed glasses were sliding down his nose, and she turned to glance over her shoulder. Great. She hadn't paused on just a hallway with a bridge overlook. She'd paused in front of another glass room, only this time it was full of young-looking professionals. Yeah, she said, swallowing. I'm fine. Sorry for the show. His chocolate-colored eyes watched her pityingly for a moment before she spun away. His concern was sweet, but it was more than she could bear at the moment. Ellie crossed the bridge swiftly. Stopping at the front receptionist's desk in the foyer, Ellie paused, slapping her hands on the counter. I made a huge mess. Is there a guy I can call? The receptionist was petite, with a blunt blonde hairstyle and large princess-like eyes. A guy? She repeated. Yeah, like a guy, you know. The receptionist's huge blue eyes blinked at Ellie uncomprehendingly, and she wondered if the woman was doing it on purpose. Like a janitor? The receptionist finally asked. Yes, Ellie responded. The lady wasn't doing blondes a favor. Someone to call to clean up the mess in conference room A? Sure thing. Picking up the phone, she dialed an extension and waited, shooting Ellie a perfunctory smile. Hi. Yes, it's me, Cassie. Can you send Harold to conference room A, please? There's a mess. Pausing, she put her hand over the receiver and glanced up. What kind of mess? 
Um, coffee? All over the floor. Cassie repeated it into the phone and hung up. Harold will be right up, she told Ellie. Thanks. Turning, Ellie walked back across the bridge and through the glass-lined hallway like she had only thirty minutes before, only this time without the ten extra drinks. She groaned softly, regretting ordering that extra peppermint tea. There never would have been a mix-up between her own beverage and Garrison's if she hadn't had a beverage to begin with. The hipsters in the design room watched her walk by again with the solemn looks of those who pitied a lesser species, and she picked up her pace to pass them quickly. Ellie had not completed her bachelor's degree at San Francisco State University simply to spit coffee all over the boardroom and then hide. She was here for real-world experience. She needed to swallow her embarrassment and get back in there. The sterile office, with nothing but glass walls and modern white spinning chairs, was not helping her Christmas spirit, though. And that was a feat, for Ellie had the ability to feel the magic of Christmas always. It was innate. Coming around the corner, she paused before conference room A as she witnessed the attendees shaking one another's hands and preparing to leave. She'd missed the whole thing. And to make matters even more awful, a man wearing a charcoal gray jumpsuit was currently mopping the mess Ellie had spewed all over the floor. Some of the men in suits filed past her toward their own offices, leaving Mr. Gaines, Garrison, and the man and woman from the museum in the conference room. Drawing in a breath, Ellie straightened her shoulders. It was pointless to hover outside the room. Pushing the glass door open, she stepped inside and scooted past the janitor, approaching the group on the other end of the room. Garrison glanced over his shoulder and held her gaze, raising his eyebrow. A small blush crept onto Ellie's cheeks, and she quickly looked away from him. "'I'll have my team formulate the demos right away and forward them for approval,' Garrison said, his voice deeper and more businesslike than Ellie had remembered. The museum executive pulled out his phone, smoothing down his mustache with one hand while he stared at the screen. "'I need things finalized within the next week. We are just swamped, so Monica will be working with you from here on out.' It won't be a problem, Mr. Gaines said. He snapped his fingers, garnering Ellie's attention. Natalie, grab the schedule from Cassie and double-check the gala has priority over every department. It's Ellie, she clarified. Mr. Gaines stared at her as though she'd sprouted an elf hat and a jingle to go with it. Names, apparently, were irrelevant to him. By the time Garrison and the museum executives turned to stare, she said, I'll get to it right away. Scurrying from the conference room, she bent her head and used her arm to keep the design team from staring at her as she crossed the bridge toward the foyer once again. "'Hi, Cassie,' Ellie said, approaching the front desk. "'I need access to the schedule?' "'Yes, ma'am,' Cassie said. Her sleek brown eyebrows rose on her forehead, proving the artificiality of the color of her hair. Ellie sucked in a breath, leaning both elbows on the high countertop of the reception desk and dropping her face in her hands." I'm sorry. I'm overwhelmed. It's my first day. I know, she said. I processed your paperwork. Peeking through her fingers, Ellie watched Cassie focus on her computer. Mr. Gaines, Ellie began. He mentioned in my interview that I could get involved in the projects, but all I've been asked for so far is to fetch coffee and check schedules. She stopped herself just in time before adding, both of which are your jobs. Cassie snapped her gum. I emailed you access to the calendar, so you shouldn't need to come back here. Ellie was surprised by the curt attitude. They were both grunts, so shouldn't they have some level of camaraderie? She tried to chat with the girl, but now Cassie was engrossed in her phone and Ellie had been summarily dismissed. It would have been less annoying if Cassie had simply explained that she was busy or something. Well, this was work. Ellie told herself she didn't need to make friends with everyone. Or anyone, apparently, except for the hipster design guy who shot pitiful eyes out of the window every time Ellie walked past it. Training her eyes on the floor, she sped across the bridge, past the design room, and ran straight into someone. Oof! Sorry! Ellie said at once, grabbing the guy's forearms to keep herself from falling over. When she glanced up and caught Garrison's amused gaze, she wanted to fall into a hole. Instead, she released him at once and took a healthy step back. He shot out his hand. Brady Garrison. She took his hand, careful to give him a firm handshake, like her grandpa taught her to do. Ellie Shaw. Welcome to the firm, Ellie Shaw. Oh, could you tell I was new? She asked. Was it the spitting coffee or the brilliant moment I tried to edge into a conversation between Mr. Gaines and the museum drones? Snapping her mouth closed, she regretted at once her impulsive nature and speaking her mind. 
It was unprofessional and petty to bring up her mistakes like that. Probably the moment you trash my coffee, he said, a smile turning up his lips. His dark eyebrows raised infinitesimally, signifying his amusement. I've been suffering ever since. You didn't drink my tea? she asked. I'm guessing they were switched? He nodded, pulling a face. The label was incorrect. It was definitely tea, and I don't drink tea. Ellie scoffed slightly. Who didn't drink tea? It was herbal. Which is gross, Brady countered. So now you owe me a coffee. She couldn't help but smile. And you owe me a tea. Garrison, Mr. Gaines shouted from across the room. I want your best work on this one. This is a great networking opportunity. He turned and saluted the man in charge. Shooting Ellie a commiserating smile, Brady said, Welcome to the company. Don't worry, it really is a great place to work. I'm sure, she agreed. I mean, at least I haven't fallen flat on my face. Brady shot her a confused look and walked away, and Ellie did her very best not to literally hit her face with her palm. Things were not getting off to the best start. Chapter 2 the worst way to begin a day at work was in a meeting with your ex-girlfriend. The worst way to begin a project at work was learning your ex-girlfriend was the liaison from the museum you're responsible for decorating for an important Christmas gala. And to make things even worse, Brady hadn't had any caffeine yet today. At least the new intern provided a little entertainment to dull the blow he'd gotten from seeing Monica. Did she really have to show up at the meeting as though she'd had no idea they would be working side by side for the next few weeks? Brady leaned back in his office chair, bringing his hands up to rest behind his neck. He surveyed the floor, noting his design team's necks bent toward their desks, dutifully working up ideas for a new, fresh take on Christmas. Because, apparently, in the world of modern art, that was a thing. He scoffed, rolling his eyes. It was one thing to spruce up Santa and his reindeer, but to replace them with Great Danes? Monica had fully lost it. What was she trying to prove, anyway? They'd split a few months ago. If she was still holding out for him, she was going to be disappointed. What had she said when he walked away from her? Oh, right. One day you'll come crawling back to me, and I'll be waiting. He scoffed out loud. Desperate much? He was pretty certain she was legitimately crazy. Bringing his forehead down to rest on his folded arms on the desk, he squeezed his eyes shut. Who was he kidding? There was a reason she had said those things when he'd walked away from her. He'd gone back to her four other times already. What was it about the woman that drew him to her? Of course, she was intelligent and gorgeous, but every time they got back together, she would do something to remind him why they broke up in the first place. Every. Single. Time. Within 24 hours, usually. And more often than not, it involved his credit card. Hey, boss, a timid-sounding man said. Brady lifted his head to find one of his junior designers standing to the side of his desk, a handful of papers clutched in his nervous hand. Hey, Zane, what's up? Zane cleared his throat. I read over your notes from the meeting and drew up some concepts for the Santa stage. He offered the stack of papers and Brady took them, flipping through them. Yeah, I'll look these over. They were basic ideas, things a ten-year-old could come up with. Brady wanted original ideas. He wanted to find a way to incorporate traditional Christmas into the sterile party Monica had asked for. He slapped the papers on his desk and leveled Zane with a look. Keep working, okay? The right thing will come. Defeated, Zane smiled bravely and went back to his seat at the long brainstorming table. He'd been brave to approach Brady with such little ingenuity, Hopefully the rest of the team came up with something better. A knock sounded against the glass door, and Brady glanced up to find the new intern standing there. Ellie Shaw. She was cute, with her blonde hair waving loosely. She smiled widely at him and lifted a coffee cup, her eyebrows raising along with her hand. Brady gestured for her to enter the room, and she did, crossing the floor with a sudden look of apprehension, her gaze darting toward the collaboration table and back. You didn't have to do that. Brady said, accepting the warm to-go cup. Ellie lifted one shoulder in a shrug. I owed you. How are you going to design a fully modern Christmas party without any caffeine in your system? He offered her a perfunctory smile. I guess that's why I've got a whole team. Oh, right. She glanced back at the table again, and her cheeks went rosy. I better get back to my desk. What does Gaines have you working on? 
Brady asked, watching her fidget. Something or someone in this room made her uncomfortable. Her hands played with the fringe on her sweater, and though he was not entirely sure, he thought he saw reindeer painted on her fingernails. Nothing yet. Ellie quickly rallied, dropping her fringe and bringing her hands up in surrender. I'm not complaining, though. I came to learn the business, and I know that will take time. She looked about the office as though seeing it for the first time. What exactly does the design team do? A lot of different components, and anything Gaines asks us for, really. But our main job is the literal architecture design, when we aren't planning parties for snooty museums, of course. He cleared his throat. We headed up the Alta building last year. It's won awards in Architects Today. Impressive. He suddenly wished he hadn't boasted. She looked suitably impressed, but he hadn't been going for that. He'd merely been explaining the breadth of his team's responsibilities. Turning back toward his computer, he typed something in to try and look busy, and then picked up his cup and took a long swig. He needed to show her he wasn't interested. The last thing he needed was another workplace relationship, especially when he was going to be working so closely on this project with Monica. I'll let you get back to it, Ellie said. Brady glanced up. Thanks for the coffee. I guess we're even now. She turned away and headed toward the door, but paused and glanced back. We'll be even when I get my tea. Brady chuckled, taking another sip of his drink. It really was too bad he decided not to date co-workers anymore. After going through concepts from his entire team that were all about the same, Brady was ready to bang his forehead against his desk. There was a reason this group of people designed buildings and not parties. But Gaines was cheap, and if he could get the gala done in-house, then he would. Brady pulled a pad of paper and pen from his drawer and set them on his desk. He really did his best thinking through ink. Flipping the pad open, he sketched a few concepts exactly how Monica requested— with a hipster Santa and a team of Great Danes set up perfectly. Really? It was ridiculous. He ripped the paper out of the sketchbook, crumpled it, and tossed it into the trash can. Try again. He closed his eyes, lowering his pen onto the paper and imagining the museum. He'd spent a fair amount of time there, walking the halls while he dated Monica, before she'd left the firm they'd both worked for prior to this job. There was a nice, large room with tall white walls and a tiled floor. It was going to be cleared of most of the art currently on display to make room for the gala. They were hoping to add a charitable function to the event as well, but Brady couldn't get his brain to worry about that yet. Tapping his pen against the paper, he opened his eyes and began to draw. He created the space on the page that he'd need to be working in, outlining the basic shape of the room. Filling in the necessary implements, Brady drew tall tables draped in cloth, with a dais in the center of the room and a Santa seated there, his arm raised as though he was waving. He drew in a few lounging dogs, because there was no way they would be able to get any animal to stand at attention the way Reindeer did for Santa. And if he was being honest, the relaxed dogs with large red collars covered in jingle bells were more fitting anyway. He surveyed the drawing, imagining the room and how he could fill it with an appropriately modern Christmas. He had a hard time wrapping his head around that, though. What did that even mean? A chat window popped up on his computer with an accompanying ding and Brady set the pen down, reading the message from Gaines' secretary, Bridget. Bridget Howard. Mr. Gaines would like to meet with you at four o'clock in his office. Bring your designs. Brady really wanted to bang his head against his desk now. He replied quickly that he would be there and closed out the chat window. He glanced over his sheet again, but nothing new came to mind. Monica wanted modern, and he got that. They needed to keep up with the image the museum already had, but weren't the gala attendees all donors and socialites? They weren't college kids and millennials. Brady opened a group chat on his computer, which included everyone on his design team, and typed. Brady Garrison. We've got to throw together a killer idea by 345. I want your best work, people. Who's got ideas? Screenshots of concepts filled the chat one after another. Some were mediocre, others... blech. He glanced around the room at the serious junior designers' faces. He was probably having a difficult time focusing because he'd missed his morning coffee, and not because he'd gone into a meeting and run straight into his ex. He was about to shut down the chat when a photo popped up that caught his eye. He clicked it, enlarging the photo to fill his screen. Unlike the rest of the concepts he'd gotten, this one wasn't hand-created with the company's elite software. It was more like an idea board thrown together by a 12-year-old. Only, it was perfect. There were images stolen from various online stores, he could tell because the prices were still on some of them, of different items they could use to decorate, 
Large, spiky, golden and silver orbs, jewel-encrusted mirrors, white Christmas trees with an array of wood-carved ornaments. There were white porcelain statues of Great Danes that the designer had photoshopped Santa hats onto. It was perfect. He clicked out of the design and searched for the sender's name. He was prepared to make whoever it was a senior designer from this alone. But that was entirely impossible, because the sender of the photo was not a designer at all. She was an intern. Brady's mouth dropped open as he read Ellie Shaw across the top of the image. How had she even gotten involved in the chat? Opening up a separate window with her alone, he ignored the dings of other ideas coming in as he typed a message. Brady Garrison. Not that I mind at all, but why are you in our group chat? Ellie Shaw. No idea. Cassie must have added me to the wrong one. Brady lifted his fingers, flexing them before typing again. Brady Garrison. Well, you're in luck. Your idea is the best I've seen today. Ellie Shaw. Yes, I knew that design degree wasn't for nothing. Brady Garrison. Meet me in front of Gaines' office at four. You just earned the right to pitch your idea to the boss. Silence met him for a moment. No more dings could be heard, and the little icon indicating the other person was typing was completely absent. He glanced up when another ding caught his attention. Ellie Shaw. I'll be there. Brady Garrison. Don't panic. He's really nice under all those scowls. Ellie Shaw. Laughing crying emoji. Brady read the message again, his eyebrows rising. His lips formed a smile. Brady Garrison. Did you really just type that out? Ellie Shaw. I don't see options for an emoji anywhere in this chat program. And clearly an emoji was the only way for Ellie to explain to him what she was feeling. He closed out the chat and leaned back in his chair. Picking up the half-empty coffee cup, Brady downed the rest of the liquid and tossed the cup into the recycle bin not far from his desk. For the first time since he had entered the conference room that morning and seen Monica's intelligent green eyes, Brady relaxed. The first hurdle was over. He was fairly sure he could convince Gaines to let him roll with this concept. The hard part, figuring out a way to head this project without spending any time with Monica, was yet to come. Chapter 3 Don't panic? Was that really his advice? Since when had that ever worked? Oh right, never. Ellie wanted to be seen by the people in charge. She wanted to learn and grow from the various components in the company and earn a place to be hired on as a legitimate employee and not just an intern. But this was her first day, and she'd begun it with a nice peppermint mocha spit spray all over the conference room during an important meeting. And she was ending it in the CEO's office with the head of design brandishing her ideas? This was bonkers. She paced the bathroom, crossing from the stalls to the door and back, watching her own reflection through the mirrors in her peripheral vision. She paused near the door, psyching herself up. She had five minutes to get there and didn't want to make Brady wait for her. It was time. She reached for the handle as the door swung open and Ellie leapt back just before getting smacked in the face by the swinging slab of wood. At least this part of the building wasn't done in glass. Whoops, sorry, Ellie said as the door opened and Cassie almost collided with her. The secretary ran past her, her face stricken with tears and her breath coming in heaving sobs. Ellie glanced at the door as it closed, then to the stall where Cassie had run. She reached for the door handle, but then dropped her arm. She couldn't just leave now. Cassie? She called hesitantly. The secretary didn't respond, but sounds of weeping reached Ellie's ears. Can I get you anything? Peace and quiet? The woman snapped through the metal door. Ellie stepped back immediately. Okay, I'll go. She left the bathroom, ignoring the ache in her chest that tugged her back toward the sad woman. Cassie clearly did not wish to be friends, but Ellie couldn't help feeling sorry for the devastations she'd seen on Cassie's face. She made an internal commitment to check on Cassie later. She'd already delayed enough. She very well could be late. Ellie's feet throbbed as her heels clicked along the floor. She crossed the large, open room full of desks and unfamiliar faces and made it to the one office with frosted glass belonging to Mr. Gaines. Brady stood outside the office door, chatting with the secretary, one hand slung casually in his pocket. He glanced up and caught Ellie's eyes. Ready? No, she said, eliciting a chuckle from Brady. You'll be fine. Just try not to spit everywhere. He gave her a teasing, encouraging smile. Ellie couldn't help but laugh a little. The secretary gave her an odd look, and Ellie sent her a bright smile. The woman had bright red curls and a very festive green bow in her hair that didn't necessarily jive with the vibe in the architecture firm, but Ellie loved it. 
The secretary picked up her phone and put it to her ear, casting a smile at Brady while she waited. Mr. Garrison and Ms. Shaw here to see you. She set the phone back on the receiver and nodded. You can go in now. Ellie followed Brady into the office, doing her best to feel worthy. She followed his lead by stepping up to the desk centered along the back window and taking a white cushioned seat in front of Mr. Gaines' desk. The man had large, round cheeks and a suit that probably cost more than Ellie's entire wardrobe. He stared into his phone, typing furiously as he glared at the screen through thick-rimmed glasses. The sound of clicking keys on his phone cut through the silence and a minute passed by before Mr. Gaines sighed and dropped his phone on the glass tabletop, forcing Ellie to jump in her chair. "'You've brought it?' he asked gruffly, glancing up at Brady. Brady placed a tablet on the table and slid it toward Gaines. The original concept came from Ms. Shaw, but I took it upon myself to expand upon it. If you swipe right, you'll see the trees and table settings my team designed. Mr. Gaines accepted the tablet and leaned back in his chair, crossing one ankle over the other. His mouth pinched in disapproval as he focused on the images, his pudgy fingers swiping through them with speed. Handing back the tablet, he looked Brady in the eye. It's good, Garrison. This is exactly what I meant when I said modern Christmas. We agreed to do this with the museum exactly for this purpose. I want new, hip, and edgy. This might be a charity function, but more importantly, it's an opportunity. For what? Ellie asked. She clamped her mouth shut when both Mr. Gaines and Brady turned to her in unison. She was supposed to be making herself look good, not inferior. Networking, building a reputation, gathering new clientele, Brady rattled off. The guest list on this gala is monstrous, and it's a prime chance to woo new clients. Ellie nodded sagely. Of course, I wasn't thinking. You're heading up this project, Mr. Gaines said, his attention on Brady. It's an important collaboration if we want access to the museum's main donor list, and we can't afford to mess it up. Brady cleared his throat, rearranging his hands before gripping the armrests on his chair. I was hoping, actually, to focus more on the Allen project. What if Jared headed this up? It would be a great opportunity for him to showcase his abilities with the promotions coming up. No, Mr. Gaines said immediately. We can't afford any mistakes. I want you heading it, Garrison. He turned his attention on Ellie with the heat of the sun. And I want you to help. Ellie swallowed, nodding. She wanted attention and opportunity, but she didn't anticipate this much or this soon. Good, that's settled. The older man slapped his hands on the desk. Now get to work. People are still talking about that stupid spring gala the Henderson Foundation threw. By Christmas, I want everyone to forget about the Henderson Foundation completely. You got it, Brady said, standing. Ellie followed his lead, jumping to her feet. Mr. Gaines speared Ellie with a look. I'm counting on you. Both of you. Don't let me down. Trepidation settled in her stomach, but Ellie nodded, holding the man's gaze. She wanted to ask why, on such little knowledge, the CEO would trust her with something this important. But she decided not to say anything which might make her seem even less worthy of the opportunity. At least, not until after they'd left the office. When the door closed behind her, Ellie kept walking with Brady. Why? she asked. Why what? She paused and Brady halted beside her. Why me? Because you came up with the concept. Tilting her head to the side, Ellie narrowed her eyes in disbelief. Has everyone forgotten that I'm just an intern? Or that it's my first day? Brady's worried lips broke into a soft smile. Maybe it's good you didn't bring that up in there. But no, I don't think anyone forgot. You aren't like our typical employees. I will try my best to find a compliment in that statement. Now, where would you like to meet to go over the basic plans for the gala? I'm guessing we need to organize and begin to delegate? Brady laughed, throwing his head back as though Ellie had said the funniest thing in the world. She glanced about the room, noticing several confused faces dotted among the desks. You really just dive in, don't you? He finally said, his blue eyes watching her closely. His mouth formed a satisfied smile. Good. This is good. We need more of this kind of eagerness in the office. Just shoot Cassie a message and she can send the schedule over. Ellie rolled her eyes. It might be easier if I hack the system and send the schedule to myself. You can hack? he asked, impressed. She deadpanned. No. Enlightenment dawned in his eyes. Did he not realize the receptionist was testy? Trouble with the receptionist? Ellie lifted her shoulder in a shrug. She just doesn't like me. Brady cupped her shoulder, giving her a friendly squeeze. She felt like a small child being comforted by her uncle. Except this guy was one of her bosses. And totally hot, but that was beside the point. He smiled reassuringly. Don't worry, she'll warm up to you. She's probably just having an off day. 
She was definitely having an off day if her crying in the bathroom was any indication. Brady began to walk away. Keep working on that vision board, he shot back over his shoulder. I have a feeling we'll need a little more material by the time we meet with Monica. Ellie nodded, but she had no idea who Monica was. Expelling a long sigh, she started toward the glass bridge. Cassie was back at her desk, and Ellie approached slowly. The poor girl's eyes were red-rimmed and irritated. She looked like a sad model, and even though she'd been nothing but snippy with Ellie all day, Ellie felt the desire to cheer her up. Hey, she said. Is everything all right? Cassie glanced up, her expression etched in stone. She looked back at her phone. I'm fine. It's nothing. Ellie waited another moment before clearing her throat. Okay. Well, I need another calendar? I gave you access already, the secretary said without looking away from her computer screen. Right, the general calendar, I believe. But I need the meeting schedule for the gala planning committee. That's design, Cassie said immediately. Ellie was impressed. For a secretary, this girl knew her stuff. Right, Ellie said again. But I'm on the project, and Brady told me to ask you for it. Her head snapped up. Brady Garrison? Yes, Ellie said, drawing the word out. He's head of design, right? Cassie cast her gaze to the ceiling in a dramatic eye roll. And a complete catch. I can't believe you're working with him already. You've been here, what, a day? Um, yeah. Shaking her head, Cassie looked back at the computer, clicking and typing. You know, he's been single for a while now. And you're cute. You should give it a try. How'd you land a position on his team? Ellie shrugged, ignoring the unprofessional comments. I got lucky. Cassie scoffed. For real? Leaning closer, she snapped her gum and raised her eyebrows. I heard he has to work with Monica Perry from the museum. I guess, Ellie said, feeling completely out of the loop. He mentioned meeting with Monica. She pulled back, her mouth forming a perfect O. So you don't know, then? Ellie did her very best not to screech, because then she might not learn what Cassie was referring to. But really? Of course she didn't know the office gossip. It was her first day. Well, I'd better fill you in so you don't show up tomorrow unprepared. Lowering her voice, she leaned forward. Monica and Brady have dated on and off for the last three years. They were crazy serious at one point. But then Brady broke it off a few months ago and they haven't seen each other in person until the meeting this morning. I'm sure she totally blindsided him. That was her? The woman in a red suit? The one who wanted Santa in a top knot with a team of dogs? Cassie nodded, grinning at her like they were best friends. Well, evidently the way to win her over was through gossip. So that's why Brady wanted someone else to run the project, Ellie said. Cassie gasped. Seriously? He asked for that? This is like a major honor. Sudden disloyalty at discussing Brady so blatantly ran through Ellie. But why, she didn't know. She didn't even know Brady, so clearly she owed him nothing. But he had been nice to her earlier, even after she threw away his coffee. I'm beginning to wish I wasn't on this project. Are you kidding? Cassie asked, disturbed. This is major. You have a front row seat to the best drama in the office. Turning away, Ellie said, I guess we'll see. Make sure to come back and tell me everything. Cassie called, and Ellie waved her hand in response as she walked away from the front desk. The woman had certainly cheered up quick. Perhaps being an intern was going to be a lot more work than Ellie had anticipated. If it boiled down to relationship management, she was out. She'd done enough of that with her parents, and she was not interested in carrying the job into her workplace. Crossing the glass bridge, she searched the design room for the hipster who had checked on her earlier. He was sitting at a large table focusing on a tablet. The poor guy looked downtrodden, and she suddenly wished to know what was wrong. Instead, she headed back toward her desk in the big room, trying to keep her day straight. She sat at the computer and pulled up the schedule Cassie had recently sent, scanning the meetings and responsibilities associated with the gala project. Oh dear. She certainly had her work cut out for her. Simply attending all these meetings was going to be a full-time job. Sitting back in her chair, a small smile grew on her lips. This was exactly why she was here. Opportunity, growth, and learning. And she was jumping in headfirst with all of those things coming at her in droves. Scanning the list again, she sighed. She really, really could use a peppermint tea right about now. Chapter 4 You'll never guess who I got saddled with on a work project. 
Brady said, sliding into the bench seat at Patterson's sports bar. Ben sat across from him, his crystal blue eyes glued to the screen above Brady's head. Hmm? Ben asked. Monica. Ben's attention snapped toward Brady. You're kidding me. I thought she worked at some fancy restaurant. A museum, but yeah. Harvard Allen Design is throwing their Christmas gala at the museum she works for, and she's gotten paired with us as the liaison. I have to work with her for the next three weeks on this project. If I survive. You'll survive. You just won't be single by the end of it. Brady reached across the table and snagged a handful of fries from his friend's plate, tossing them into his mouth. Get your own, man, Ben said, his eyes never leaving the TV screen. Brady ignored him, his mind wrapping around his dilemma. He didn't have to be around Monica forever, just for a few weeks until the project was over. I can do it. I can say no this time, Ben laughed. Sure you can. Brady's stomach hardened. He propped his elbows on the table and dropped his face into his hands. What is it about her that makes me lose my mind? I don't get it, I just don't know how to say no to her. Those puppy dog eyes, maybe? Her irresistible smile? Brady peeked up over his hands. Yes, definitely both of those. Ben's nose screwed up in disgust. I don't see it. I was being sarcastic. I can picture the devil horns she hides under her hair, however. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I have to figure out something. I can't work with her for three weeks. She'll draw me back in. She always does. Too bad you aren't married, Ben said, chuckling. Brady glanced up. That's it. I'll get married. Monica might be crazy, but she wouldn't expect me to leave my wife for her. Ben lifted his eyebrow, as though he expected Monica to do the exact opposite. A waitress approached with a pad of paper and a pen. Her eyes were smudged with thick black eyeliner and blue hair snuck out from a Santa hat slouched on her head. What can I get you? I'll take a basket of buffalo wings and a basket of honey barbecue wings. She wrote on her pad, tapped it with the edge of her pen, and then smiled down at Brady. Anything else? Just water. The waitress hesitated a moment before spinning away. But who could I marry? He asked at once, his mind working around the problem. He'd meant it as a joke, but now the idea was percolating and beginning to carry merit. But who? There were loads of women he knew, but none of them he'd want to spend the rest of his life with. You aren't serious, Ben said, his eyes drawing down in concern. That's really drastic. Brady shook his head. Ben didn't realize the amount of effort it took simply to be around Monica, let alone reject her. She'd nearly depleted his bank account a few months ago, planning a trip to Cabo, and that wasn't taking into account the sheer amount of time she expected him to shop with her. I can't do it anymore. She drains me. Yeah, she does. Your bank account, your willpower, your man card. Brady speared his friend with a glare. Exactly. So I should just find a wife and be done with it all. She seems willing, Ben said, nodding his head toward the waitress. Brady turned to find the woman eyeing him, a suggestive smile on her lips. He shuddered. No thanks. Blue hair isn't really my thing. Ben leaned in, resting his folded arms on the tabletop. I know your problem, Brady. You need to be in a relationship so you can't say yes to Monica, no matter what. But you don't need a wife for that. You just need a girlfriend. He had a really valid point, but it still only made sense in theory. There was no way he would be able to get a girlfriend in under 24 hours. Probably just as difficult to achieve. Ben lifted a finger, his cheeks rounding as his smile grew. No, not a real girlfriend. A fake one. The room seemed to go still as Ben's idea settled in Brady's mind. It could actually work. He only needed to tell Monica he was dating someone else and she wouldn't even try to get with him again. And if she did, well, Brady would have a concrete, valid reason to tell her no. That's brilliant. Ben sat back in the booth, his gaze drawing back to the screen behind Brady's head. A satisfied smile played on his lips. I know. Chuckling, Brady reached across the table and pilfered another handful of fries. He had to hand it to the man. The idea was flawless. Brady could invent any girl he wanted, give her a backstory, and be done with it. His food arrived, and he thanked the waitress before lifting his water glass for a toast. To keeping Monica off my back he said, tapping Ben's glass with his own. Ben chuckled, his eyes never leaving the TV screen. Good luck, man. You're gonna need it. After letting herself into her apartment, Ellie kicked off her shoes and closed her eyes, inhaling the delightful aroma of garam masala and lemon. Kayla must have cooked chicken tikka masala again, and it smelled heavenly.
Blessed relief washed over her bare feet, and Ellie leaned down to massage the heel of her foot. She'd been overzealous in her professional attire that day. She'd had no idea exactly how much walking she would be forced to do as an intern when she put on the gorgeous black heels. Of course, the coffee run was fine, but the second coffee run specifically for Brady's drink was probably what did her in. It had been worth it, though, just to see the look on his face when she'd handed him the to-go cup. Ellie, get in here and try this sauce, Kayla called. Dropping her bag on the sofa, Ellie turned into the small kitchen and leaned against the counter. Kayla stood at the stove, a wooden spoon resting in her hand. She blew softly on the spoonful of sauce she held and gave Ellie a quick once-over. How'd it go? Great. A little too great, maybe? Kayla's black, frizzy hair was pulled up in a messy bun with a scarf rolled up and tied around it. Even in her messy housekeeping days when she wasn't volunteering for kids after school, the program where Kayla and Ellie had originally met in elementary school, she was effortlessly cute. She passed the spoon over, lifting her eyebrows. Ellie tasted the sauce and an explosion of spices and flavors met her tongue. Yes, she said, nodding. This is amazing. Kayla's face was a mixture of pride and delight as she accepted the spoon back and continued to stir. She moved to the side of the stove and lifted a linen towel to reveal perfect oblong naan, and Ellie moaned. She turned toward the cabinets to pull down two plates and began setting the table. Kayla filled a plate with naan. So you're telling me you didn't trip at all? Ellie shook her head. Not once. I did spray coffee all over the floor during a meeting, but that didn't stop the head of design from choosing my concept for the Harvor Allen Christmas Gala. Kayla looked impressed, plopping the last of the naan on the plate. I don't even know which question to ask first. I'll save you then, Ellie said, picking up the plate of naan and taking it to the table. She sat at her chair while Kayla plopped the pot of Indian food on the trivet and went back for the rice. I was accidentally added to the wrong group chat, so when the head of design asked everyone to send their concepts for the Christmas gala, I sent one too. I'd been bugged by this obnoxious drone during the meeting requesting a modern Christmas theme, so I challenged myself to figure something out that would appease the client and myself. And they loved it, Ellie nodded, her eyes growing wide. They loved it. So I met with the head of design and the CEO, and now I'm on the project. The schedule is crazy for it, but I couldn't ask for a better opportunity. Spooning rice onto both plates, Kayla shook her head. Don't mess up the chance to show them how valuable you are. No pressure, Ellie said, lifting her plate closer to the pot while Kayla filled it. And I have to work with the head of design and the liaison from the museum, who apparently have a history. She eyed her friend closely. Speaking of history, did I see a yellow Volkswagen turning down our street when I got home? Kayla trained her face on her food. You know I'm not stupid, right? Ellie said. Just because you don't want to see your mom doesn't mean I have to ignore your mom, Kayla said defensively. I'm not going to be rude to the woman. Ellie groaned, dropping her forearm to rest on the table. What did she want? Kayla's gaze flicked to a paper on the counter. To drop off your grandmother's fruitcake recipe. She would love it if you could bring it to the family Christmas party. I'm not going to the family Christmas party. Ellie bit back with more edge than Kayla deserved. It's the same night as the gala, but even if I wasn't working, I wouldn't go. I don't even know most of those people. She dropped her fork and brought her fingers up to rub her eyes. I've just started this brand new position and things are going really well and I'm going to be swamped all month. I don't have time to deal with my mom's drama, let alone make a flipping fruitcake. Then don't. Silence fell over them as neither woman ate their dinner. Ellie sucked in a breath, looking her best friend in the eyes. I'm sorry, I don't expect you to turn my mom away. You're too good of a person for that anyway. Well, duh, Kayla said, taking a bite of her naan. I've seen the woman once a year, if I was lucky, for most of my life. She can't expect me to just drop everything now and build a relationship from scratch. She lost her chance at that when she turned me into a marriage counselor between her and my dad, Ellie scoffed. And they were never even married. Now can we hurry up and eat? We've got a lot to do tonight. Kayla let the conversation change without a fight. She'd been around during high school when Ellie's mom first made an effort with her. And then when Ellie discovered that her mom was really only interested to hear about what was going on in her dad's life even though Ellie didn't have a real connection with him, either. Kayla sighed dramatically. Let me guess, you're planning to blast some Mariah Carey and force me to hang twinkle lights? No, Ellie said, chewing a large bite. She pointed her fork at her friend. I'm going to blast wham while you dig the ornaments out and I place them on the tree. 
Kayla laughed, shaking her head. It's a good thing I love you so much or your OCD would drive me up the wall. Ellie raised one eyebrow. It wasn't OCD. Or maybe it was, but she'd never been diagnosed. It's called Attention to Detail, and it's what landed me this amazing opportunity with the design team at Harvard Allen. Now come on and eat. It's December 1st and I get to decorate. Chapter 5 The morning was crisp and cool, with a thick layer of fog hovering low to the earth. Ellie sped walked down the sidewalk with a steaming cup of peppermint tea in her hands. Her skin felt damp from the moisture in the air, and she was glad she'd thrown her hair into a ballerina bun or it would be frizzy and flat by now. Turning the corner to the front doors of her office building, it felt so cool to consider it her office building. Ellie nearly ran into a man standing still in the center of the sidewalk. She jumped to the side just in time to avoid a collision, but her drink flew from her hands. Arcing through the air, the cardboard to-go cup fell onto the concrete with a splat, and Ellie's shoulders sunk accordingly. It was so hot and fresh, she hadn't even had one sip yet. She blew out a sigh as she bent to retrieve the cup and tossed it into the trash can, avoiding the tea pooling on the sidewalk. I guess I owe you two drinks now. Glancing over her shoulder, Ellie caught Brady's eye. You most certainly do owe me two drinks, she said, turning to face him. He offered her a wan smile before glancing back at the building. She stepped closer. Why was he standing in the center of the sidewalk? We've got a meeting in fifteen minutes, I believe, she said diplomatically. Yes, we do, Brady agreed, his eyes never leaving the building. And it's in the office up there, she said, pointing up the side of the tall building. Brady nodded, swallowing visibly. Yes, it is. He looked nervous. His eyebrows pulled together in concern. He'd slung his hands casually in his pockets as though he hadn't a care in the world, but the expression on his face plainly said otherwise. Perhaps he only needed a minute to gather himself together. Well, I'll see you up there, boss, Ellie said, offering him a smile. She wanted to joke about her drink again with the hope that he'd use this contemplation time to go order her a new one from the bean around the corner, but he looked so distracted. She opted to keep her mouth shut. Wait, he said, bringing his gaze down to rest on her. People passed them on the sidewalk, but Brady's gaze was so intense, Ellie felt completely isolated within it. Now it was her turn to feel nervous under the weight of his attention. Yeah? I wonder... Brady regarded her closely, his eyes narrowing slightly as he took a minuscule step closer. How old are you? Ellie's eyebrows shot up on her forehead. She hadn't known what to expect, but that certainly wasn't it. Did he worry about her capability of helping with the project? I don't know how young I look, Mr. Garrison, but I graduated from SFSU with a bachelor's in design, and I am perfectly capable of handling a meeting with Monica Perry. They're my ideas, after all. And she'd spent hours the evening before developing a presentation after all the decorations were up in her apartment. She was ready. Brady cringed. No, I didn't mean... That is, I wanted to make sure... Honestly, just forget it. He shook his head, taking a step back, and Ellie found that she didn't like his retreat very much. I'm 24. I took a few extra years in school to figure out what I wanted to do, so I didn't graduate right away. And I am willing to do whatever I need to make this project go as smoothly as I can. He stilled. Anything? Of course, she said sympathetically. She realized this was probably really difficult for him, working with an ex-girlfriend. Ellie didn't mind taking on extra work if she needed to in order to ease his burdens. He sucked in a breath and asked, How do you feel about being my girlfriend? Shock rippled through her. Had she heard him correctly? She wanted to ask him to repeat himself, but she couldn't speak. Did her face reflect how freaked out she felt? He stepped closer, lifting one hand. I better rephrase. I don't mean for real, I mean pretend. How would you feel about pretending to be my girlfriend? He could not be serious. Of course the guy was hot, but Ellie wasn't that desperate for a relationship. I really don't think Harver Allen would look kindly on such a personal relationship between employees. Of course not. No, I'm not hitting on you, he said, stepping closer. I really mean fake girlfriend. I have to meet with my ex-girlfriend up there and she just... He ran a hand through his hair and sighed. No, you're right. It wouldn't work. The company would fry us. And I'm sure you've got a boyfriend already. I don't know what I was thinking. That's all right, Ellie said, a little worried about the mental state of her boss. 
A fake relationship just to avoid an ex? Now that was desperate. I'd better get up there, though. I can get the meeting started. Take your time. She scurried into the building, eager to get into the office. Chills ran down her arms as she recalled the desperation on Brady's face. She felt for him. It couldn't be easy working that closely with an ex. But really? A fake girlfriend? That was too much. The elevator ride felt quick, and the metal door slid open facing Cassie's desk. The perky blonde glanced up and grinned at once, her eyes widening. She's here already, Cassie whisper yelled as Ellie approached. I put her in conference room B and told her you'd be in shortly. You better hurry. Who? Ellie asked. Monica Perry? Yes, Cassie said gravely. And she looks good. What was that supposed to mean? Why did that even matter? Thanks, Cassie, Ellie said, tapping the counter with her hand before turning away. She paused, turning back. Does the office put any decorations up for the holidays? Cassie shrugged. Not that I know of. Bummer. It could really cheer up the entrance here. Ellie turned away. The office was so sterile already with glass walls and modern desks. Everything was so bright and clean, but not in a good way. The elevator music playing in the lobby could easily be changed to something more festive, which would alter the feeling in the entrance drastically. There were only 23 days left until Christmas, after all. Dropping her bag in the large drawer of her desk, Ellie retrieved her company tablet and sketchbook and tucked them between her folded arms and her chest. She'd been reasonable that morning when she'd gotten dressed and wore a solid pair of wedged booties with her pixie-cut pants. She felt secure today and much more comfortable in her ankle-high reindeer socks that no one else could see than she had in her heels the day before. Excuse me, Ellie said, leaning toward a busy-looking man at a nearby desk. He glanced up, and she realized it was the man who'd snapped his fingers at her during the meeting. Where can I find conference room B? Just on the other side of the break room, he said quickly, eyeing her with irritation. Nice, so there was a break room. Why had no one given her a solid tour of the facilities the day before? And where's the break room? The man quit typing and looked at Ellie. Down that hall, he said, pointing to a hallway behind the large glass-enclosed conference room where she'd spat her drink the day before. Thanks. Checking her phone for the time, Ellie slid it into her pocket and hurried down the hall, past a room with a few tables and a refrigerator, and directly into a smaller conference room than the one they'd met in the day before. Hello, she said, coming into the room quickly and holding her head up as though she had every right to be there. Which she did. Monica Perry sat on a swiveling plastic chair, her crossed legs visible under the clear glass table. Her pinched mouth and perfectly drawn-on eyebrows indicated extreme irritation, enough to rival even Cassie. Two festive to-go cups sat on the table near her. You aren't Brady. She sounded as annoyed as she looked and immediately picked up her phone, swiping it on and tapping furiously into it as though Ellie was not there. I am not Brady. Ellie agreed, coming into the room. She lifted her chin. She was on the project, designated for the position by the CEO of Harvard Allen himself. She had every right to be in that meeting, and she was not going to back down to this cow. I'm Ellie Shaw, and I'm looking forward to working with you on this project, Miss Perry. Ellie stuck out her hand and gazed down at Monica with all of the confidence in the world. Monica stared at her hand before reaching forward and giving her a quick, impatient shake. Good morning, ladies. Brady said, sweeping into the room with a dazzling smile. He carried his own tablet and skirted the room, pulling out a chair opposite Monica at the table. He'd lost the nervous, vacant look he'd worn outside just minutes before, but Ellie wondered if he was overcompensating with enthusiasm. Good morning, Brady. I could really go for one of those raspberry pastries, Monica said, lowering her voice as though she was sharing a secret with him. We could send your assistant down for one. I really miss this building sometimes. Brady's smile grew tight. Sure thing, Monica. He glanced up and caught Ellie's eye. His own were hard and unrelenting. No way. Ellie was an intern, yes, but she was not put on this project to fetch pastries. She stood beside Monica, clutching her tablet with white knuckles and breath abated. The way Brady treated her now would set the tone for her role in the company for the next three weeks. Perhaps she should have agreed to his ludicrous idea. As his girlfriend, she would certainly not be fetching pastries. Ellie, could you send a message to Cassie and request those pastries? My assistant is out for the day, but I'm sure Cassie can coordinate the request. 
Ellie's shoulders relaxed and she nodded, pulling out a chair beside Monica and lowering herself into the seat. He hadn't asked her to go. Turning on her tablet, she pulled up the chat window and already had a conversation bar flashing with Cassie's name across the top. Cassie Jones. Warning! Brady is on his way! I repeat, Brady has just passed my desk and he's headed for you now! Cassie Jones. Hello? Did you get my warning? Cassie Jones. Ah! He must be there by now! How is it going? Has Monica jumped on him yet? Ellie did her best to swallow her smile. Ellie Shaw. We haven't even started yet. Brady wants you to get some raspberry pastries for the meeting. From downstairs, I'm guessing? Cassie Jones. I will be there in five minutes. Closing out the chat window, Ellie pulled up the files she'd been working on the night before. After the holiday music and Christmas tree decorating had been completed, Kayla had gone out for her night job waitressing at Pepper, and Ellie had crashed on the couch with the Grinch playing in the background. She'd compiled a better group of photos and organized them into a presentation. Shall we begin? Brady asked. Ellie started to angle her tablet so both Brady and Monica could see the screen. I was hoping to show you... I want to go over my notes from the meeting, Monica said, looking at Brady with immense focus and a smile too playful to be considered business appropriate. Brady glanced to Ellie and she could see the strain in his eyes. His lips formed a tight smile and he said, Very well, we can begin there. I want to nail down our exact design so the invitations can go out by the end of the week. Monica nodded. We've got to finalize the guest list, too. Since the museum is putting their name on this, I've brought a list of heavy hitters who can't be forgotten. Heavy hitters? What charity is benefiting from the gala? Ellie asked, opening a new document on her tablet to take notes. I don't know, Monica said, brushing her off with a flick of her Tiffany bracelet-endowed wrist. We'll figure that out later. She turned toward Brady. I was thinking further on the dog situation, and I can't help but feel that live dogs in the museum might be a handful. Brady nodded. My team has already addressed the issue. In fact, we've found something better. He lifted his eyebrows, giving Ellie a loaded look. She tried to return his widened eyes with her own, but he didn't seem to be reading her message. She understood that he was trying to hand the conversation off to her, but what was the point of speaking when every time she opened her mouth, Monica cut her off? He didn't get the message. Ellie here actually found some great ideas and created a vision board, which I think you'll like. If you'd like to pull it up, Ellie... Brady gestured toward her tablet with seemingly flailing patience. I'm sure Monica would be thrilled to see it. How could she argue with that? Of course, it's right. Knock, knock! Cassie said loudly, barging into the room and dropping a paper bag with oil seeping through the bottom edges on the table near Ellie's elbow. I've brought pastries! They didn't have the raspberries, so I picked up a selection instead, and there are a few muffins in there too, if you'd prefer those. Thanks, Cassie, Ellie said, eyeing the bag. The woman stood beside her chair, grinning as she glanced between Monica and Brady. It was my pleasure. Anything else I can get you? Oh, she exclaimed, glancing over Ellie's shoulder. Are those the ideas for the gala? That's gorgeous. Ellie cleared her throat. These are just a few vague ideas. We've still got to nail down the logistics. If we ever get the chance. She glanced up and caught Brady's amused eye. Her tablet buzzed, and she clicked on the blinking chat bar headed with Brady Garrison. Brady Garrison. I don't think this meeting is going to be productive at all. Cassie had turned her attention on Monica, asking what exactly she did for the museum and how she played a role within the planning of the gala. Ellie turned her tablet slightly so she could type without them seeing her message. Ellie Shaw. It definitely won't be productive if I can't get a full sentence out. Maybe the meeting should be in chat form so no one will interrupt me. Brady Garrison. Salty much? Ellie glanced up and swallowed a smile when her gaze rested on Brady's amused expression. A smile played on his lips in a most attractive way. Too bad the offer he'd made her that morning wasn't to be his real girlfriend. Really, the guy was hot. But then again, that would be weird and, as her boss, also inappropriate in the workplace. Hey, Cassie, Brady said, leaning back in his chair. Who's answering the phones right now? She shot him a saucy smile. The machine. His eyebrows rose and she rolled her eyes, but she got the hint. It was nice to meet you, Monica. I hope I see you around. Monica looked at Brady. I think you'll be seeing quite a bit of me in the future. Well, if that wasn't a direct insinuation, then Ellie was Mrs. Claus and Cassie's pleased smile indicated her understanding. She was like a moth to a flame when it came to this drama.
Ellie pulled up her presentation again and set it between her and Monica. We are thinking of a totally wooden theme with green and brass thrown in for a chic take on classic Christmas. Do you want to run down and grab me a coffee to go with these pastries? Monica asked, finally looking Ellie in the eye. The woman had a gaze which seared like a hot iron when she leveled it on Ellie. But Ellie was not about to leave the meeting, not for such a paltry excuse. She couldn't help but look to the two to-go cups which sat near Monica's elbow and had remained untouched for the duration of the meeting. Monica followed her gaze. Those are cold now. I could use a hot drink. Monica, Ellie is part of the team, Brady said. You can't send her to run your errands. But we are such a fantastic team, she replied, her voice going low and silky. We don't need anyone else. The suggestion in her voice was mirrored in her expression, and Ellie wanted to leave the room. This woman was so blatant it was nauseating. If this was how she acted with another person in the room, how badly would she come onto Brady if they were left alone? Well, it wasn't really Ellie's problem, and she couldn't help but think that if she just gave them a moment together, Monica could get it out of her system, whatever it was, and then they would be able to get to work. Pushing back her chair, Ellie rose. Monica looked pleased for the first time that morning, and Ellie shot her a tight smile. What can I get you? Just a coffee. Black. Great. And you? She turned to Brady and paused. He looked worried. His eyes were wide and panicked as he swallowed audibly. Peppermint mocha? she asked. He widened his gaze further. You can send Cassie, he offered. This isn't part of your job. Ellie lifted an eyebrow. It isn't really Cassie's either. Actually, Brady said, standing. I will go and get the drinks. You stay and explain the design elements to Monica. What is going on here? Monica asked, her voice going hard and irritation slithering into the set of her shoulders. It's almost as if you were trying to avoid me, Brady. Send the intern for the coffee. We have a lot to catch up on. The panic in his eyes was enough to confirm to Ellie that he desperately wished to avoid that very scenario. She shouldn't have been so quick to dismiss his plea down on the sidewalk earlier that morning. The man was in distress, and this woman was the cause. One small, idle meeting had already caused him alarm to a ridiculous degree, and they were going to be forced to work together closely for the next three weeks. Actually, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with this anymore, Ellie said, turning back toward Monica. The woman's dark eyebrows arched up in confusion, and Ellie found she couldn't look at Monica while she lied. She turned her attention to Brady instead and hoped she wasn't making a horrible mistake. I know we're supposed to keep this out of the office, but I'm not sure I like you spending alone time with your ex. Brady stood across the clear glass table from her, his face a work of stone. You don't? He asked slowly, his words coming out as though he was trying to figure out what they meant while he was saying them. No, Ellie said. I know it was my idea to keep things quiet, but it's probably just easier if we come clean now. Brady's gaze flicked to Monica and back. If he'd caught on to what Ellie was trying to do, he surely wasn't helping it along. Ellie clasped her hands together in front of herself and turned toward Monica. I know this can't be comfortable for you to hear, but for the welfare of this project, I feel it is prudent to inform you that Brady and I are dating. Monica's face went white. Her hands gripped one another on her lap and she turned a strained face toward Brady. Is this true? A slow smile spread over his lips as he nodded slowly, his eyes never leaving Ellie's. She could get used to him looking at her with such appreciation. We promised Mr. Gaines we would leave the romance out of the office, so we haven't told many people. The room was pregnant with silence. Ellie lowered herself into her chair and turned on her tablet, pleased to see a message from Brady which simply read, Thank you. Taking advantage of Monica's stunned silence, Ellie pulled up her vision board for the gala, cleared her throat, and began. Chapter 6 Monica had watched him closely after the sudden announcement during the meeting, and Brady had felt thoroughly under investigation by her gaze. But it had been worth it. The meeting had finally progressed. Ellie had delivered a perfect presentation, and decisions were discussed and finalized regarding the theme, guest list, and invitations. Brady stood shoulder to shoulder with Ellie on the bridge walkway outside of the design room and watched Monica sashay toward the elevators. She cast a final, curious glance over her shoulder before stepping through the metal doors 
and Brady held his breath until the elevator slid shut and the woman was gone from sight. Sighing, he pivoted toward Ellie. I don't know how I can ever thank you for agreeing. Not so fast, Ellie said, facing him and lifting a finger. I've got a few stipulations to go over first. He swallowed. Women were so complicated. What was there to discuss? She'd pretend to date him during the meetings, and they could go about their normal lives otherwise. This is purely for Monica, she said, lifting her honey-colored eyebrows. Otherwise, it's business as usual. Agreed, he said. And I'm feeling charitable right now, which is the only reason I agreed to this, but it stops with Christmas. After that, you're on your own. I can agree to that, he said. And no kissing, she added, her finger still raised as though she was berating a small child. I'm sure HR would flip if they learned about this, but to protect ourselves, let's just keep the physical contact out of the equation. That will be easy, since we're trying to appease our boss anyway. The corner of her mouth lifted in an amused smile, her eyes sparkling. Yeah, that was quick thinking. If Monica thinks Gaines is okay with you dating an intern, then it's a lot more believable. Brady began walking toward his office, and Ellie fell into step beside him. He turned to look at her and noticed she had a scar on her temple. Drawing his eyebrows in, he indicated it with a flick of his chin and asked, How did that scar get there? Her cheeks went beet red and she dipped her head. It was cute. He'd seen her embarrassed when she spit his coffee all over the boardroom, but he hadn't seen her shy like this yet. Clearing her throat, she delivered a bashful smile. I fell while dancing. In high school. Gesturing toward her tablet, she nodded her head over toward her own desk down the hall. I better get on these invitations. He watched her start to walk away. Calling after her, he waited for her to make eye contact. We're just meeting at the museum in the morning. Would you want to meet here and ride over together? That might be more believable, Ellie agreed. I'll see you here at eight. Something tugged at his stomach to follow her, but that was absurd. He had work to do and a team to manage, and they were all in the design room just behind him. The intern with a bouncy step and tacky Christmas-themed earrings had her own tasks to manage. Shaking out his head like a wet hound dog, Brady pushed the door open into the design room and dropped onto his chair. Zane crossed the floor and paused in front of his desk, and Brady lifted his eyebrows. I just wanted to ask if you've looked over the file I sent you yesterday, about my designs for the new Bear Mobile building. Sorry, Zane. There's been too much going on with this gala project. I'll have to look sometime today. Zane's face fell, but he managed a brave nod, and Brady offered him a tight smile, waiting for him to retreat to his own desk. The guy hadn't been overly inventive thus far, and Brady was hesitant to give his ideas any stock. He hated letting the guy down, but this was business. After Ellie's presentation showcasing the delicate balance between a modern Christmas and traditional components, Brady had been feeling more festive than usual, which was a feat since he absolutely hated the holidays. But what was there to like? It was one of the few times his family all got together and, much like the rest of America, it always ended in fighting and gloom. Christmas never felt good. Christmas was a chore. But Ellie clearly did not agree with him if her little snowman earrings or subtle pushes for more traditional components were any clue. One large Christmas tree as a centerpiece at the gala with an enormous star and an invitation for guests to bring one ornament to place upon it was as traditional as it gets. Making it more enjoyable by allowing each guest to select a different ornament to take home with them was brilliant. It was a high-end white elephant gift exchange. A smile lit his lips as he imagined Ellie giving the presentation. She might be fresh from college, but she knew what she was about, and she had excelled during that meeting earlier. Opening his laptop, Brady pushed the intern from his mind and focused on work. Except, after multiple attempts to organize his thoughts, he was still stuck on Ellie's long blonde hair and the winning smile she'd given him when she had glanced from Brady to Monica at the close of her presentation and realized that she had done it successfully. Although that triumph could have been due to the fact that Ellie was able to deliver the entire thing without further interruptions from Monica, but Brady had a feeling she had been proud of herself, too. Leaning back in his chair, he ran a hand through his hair and blew out an exasperated breath. Focus, man. Sitting forward in his chair, Brady pulled up his email and got to work catching up after the meeting. It was time to separate his business and personal lives mentally. The staff room was nicer than her kitchen at home, and Ellie found that if she waited until later in the afternoon, most everyone else had already come and gone. She sat at the small white table in the corner and pulled out her phone, scanning through posts on social media and mindlessly eating her peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
You are the worst sort of confidant, Cassie said, crashing into the room. She pulled out the chair opposite Ellie and sat down, plopping a clear takeout box full of salad on the table. Crossing her arms over her chest, she leveled Ellie with a look. What happened this morning? And don't tell me nothing, because I saw how disappointed Monica looked when she stalked out of here. Nothing, Ellie said around a bite of her sandwich. She offered a close-lipped smile and picked up her water bottle for a sip. Rolling her eyes, Cassie opened the salad and began moving lettuce around with a fork. What did Brady say to her? I know this will be a disappointment, but Brady didn't say anything. Ellie took another bite of her sandwich and looked the receptionist in the eye. It was not a lie, exactly. Brady didn't tell Monica he was dating Ellie. Ellie did. And she wasn't quite sure yet if Cassie was the right person to trust with this secret. Cassie's exaggerated frown was interrupted with chewing as she took a bite of her salad. Bummer! I wonder if they texted each other then. The woman came in looking so smug and top lofty, I was rooting for someone to knock her down a peg. Ellie shrugged. So who's answering the phones right now? Cassie shot her a sly smile. The machine. I never step away for long, but I've been instructed not to eat at the desk anymore, so they'll have to deal with waiting a half hour for their messages. That seems reasonable. What's not reasonable is Mr. Harvey taking all of the popcorn from the office. I'm sure he did it after everyone left for the day. He's been complaining about the smell for weeks, like it's a bad thing to smell popcorn. Can you even? No, I can't even, Ellie responded, drinking more of her water. She didn't care if there was or wasn't popcorn in the kitchen. I know! And did you hear about Mandy from the legal department? She was caught sleeping at her desk last week, more than once. Cassie lifted her eyebrows. Ellie waited for her to continue. You know what that means, right? I'm sure you can tell me, Ellie said, amused. She had made the right choice in keeping her secret to herself. Evidently, Cassie didn't know how to not share information. Obviously, there's trouble at home or she wouldn't be staying so late she falls asleep. Herbert Allen is spotless. Legal doesn't have that much work to do to keep her that late. Chair legs scraped against the cool tile floor as Ellie pushed back from the table and rose. I've got to get back to work. Cassie watched her through narrowed, disbelieving eyes. Right. Let me know if anything happens at your meeting tomorrow. Sure thing. Ellie called over her shoulder before tossing her garbage in the trash can and heading back toward her desk. Cassie was difficult to predict. Her mood seemed to change as frequently as Monica had interrupted during that morning's meetings. Which was a lot. Turning down the hallway, Ellie bumped shoulders with someone coming the opposite direction and jumped out of the way. A tablet fell to the floor and skittered against the wall with a resounding thud. Shoot, Ellie said, reaching for the tablet. I'm so sorry, I didn't even see you. She glanced at the screen and was immensely relieved to find it unbroken. Lifting her gaze, she met the eyes of the hipster guy who checked on her outside the design room the day before. Oh, hi, she said. He reached forward. I'm Zane. I'm Ellie. She shook his hand and laughed. It seems like we can't meet under normal circumstances. His returning laugh was polite, and he indicated the tablet. Ellie's cheeks went warm as she handed it to him. Had he been reaching for it earlier and not trying to shake her hand? Welcome to the company, he said politely. It's a great place to work for the most part. Thanks, Ellie said. There was an awkward moment of silence when Zane looked around like he didn't know what to say. Well, I guess I'll see you around, she said, turning to go. It was a good thing she already had a best friend at home, because work did not appear to be the place she was going to make lasting relationships. Chapter 7 Ellie arrived at the office at 8 sharp and waited in front of the building for Brady. The museum wasn't too far away, but it was enough of a distance that they'd likely grab a cab. You're early, Brady said, hurrying toward her with two to-go cups in his hands. She glanced at her watch. Actually, I was on time. You are late. He gave her a once-over before handing her one of the cups and turning back the way he came. We should decide how we want to explain our romance to Monica. And good morning to you, too, Ellie said, pulling the straps of her bag higher on her shoulder. She smelled the tea. It was peppermint. Thanks. No problem. I'm a little anxious, he said with a bashful smile. Monica makes me crazy. Evidently. Brady paused on the sidewalk, pulling on Ellie's sleeve until she turned to face him. Listen, I realize this whole thing is kind of crazy, but I really appreciate you helping me out. Monica has got this ability to make me come back to her every time we break up, 
and I don't know how she does it, but I always find myself back in a toxic relationship with her, willing to give it another shot. This, he indicated to himself and Ellie with a hand gesture, will keep her from even trying. I don't know about that, but it's worth a shot. And that is why I appreciate you, he said. Ellie turned back toward the street and waited for Brady to wave down a cab. Climbing into the smelly back seat, she waited for Brady to give the driver their direction, and then said, So, as far as our office romance is concerned, we can say that it was love at first meeting. I mean, we do have a cute intro story with the spitting coffee in the boardroom. Brady lifted an eyebrow. I'm not sure that qualifies as cute. Ellie scoffed. Come on, be a gentleman. At least pretend you found it cute. As my boyfriend, you know you totally would. He gave her a heart-melting smile. Well, as your boyfriend, I can pretend, I guess. The taxi came to a stop and they stepped onto the busy sidewalk before climbing the pristine white marble steps to the museum entrance. The entrance to the museum was large and spacious, studded with white painted columns throughout the room, with vast vaulted ceilings overhead. There were various art pieces on display, but Ellie could see how perfectly the main floor would work for the gala when they were removed. Heel steps clicked, echoing through the room. Good morning, Monica said, coming toward them with her hair slicked back into a sleek ponytail. She wore a black pencil skirt, offset with a crisp white shirt. Her cheerful smile was belied by the strain and the slight wrinkles around her eyes. Shall we begin with a tour? That would be great, Ellie said. Well, this is our main foyer, as you can see by the desk and our fabulous Julianne here, Monica said, sweeping her hand to indicate the front desk and ticket sales information behind a short, curly-haired employee. We have a coat check room just beyond that door over there, and we'll station security guards around the entrance here. And employees to accept invitations, Ellie added. With the high-value art contained in this building, we should probably do our best to ensure that only invited members enter through these doors. Precisely, Monica said crisply. Moving along, we've got a lot of open space to set up. Ellie stepped away from the group, walking around the room and envisioning the gala how she had designed it in her mind. She came upon an art piece in the very center of the room and stopped, surveying the room from that vantage point. It was precisely in the center, and from there it was clear that the pillars were designed in a loose circle around the very middle of the room. Artfully done, of course, because it was unclear that they were meant to be a circle until Ellie stood in that very place. "'What do you think?' Brady asked, approaching her with a casual step. Ellie glanced over his shoulder to Monica, who was following close behind him. "'Will this piece be moved before the gala? This is the perfect place for the gifting tree.' "'The gifting tree,' Brady said. "'I like that.' "'Yes, this will be moved to a separate floor next week.' "'Fantastic,' Ellie said. "'The tree can go here.' We can put cocktail tables around the main floor for mingling, and then set up tables over there in front of the steps for the ceremony. The other two were quiet as Ellie finished speaking, and she glanced between them, suddenly acutely aware of her own low status within the company she represented. She turned to Brady. If you think that would be wise, of course. He nodded, impressed. I think that would be perfect. I'm not sure I'd be able to come up with anything better. He turned to Monica. What do you think? It's fine, I guess. Should we go to my office and discuss the charity details? Brady looked to Ellie and she agreed. Let's. They reached the elevator when Monica stopped suddenly and offered Brady a sweet smile. Would you be a doll and fetch us some of those delicious pastries? I'm sure we'll all be famished by the time we are finished hammering out these details. It was a job so beneath Brady that Ellie wanted to sink into the floor from embarrassment. Was Monica playing her status here, or did she have another reason to get him to leave? I can run out for something, Ellie said quickly. Brady was protected by their relationship now, anyway. I'm the intern, after all. No, I'll go, Brady said. Just have Julianne get you up to the right floor when you return, Monica said. He spun for the door and disappeared from sight right away. Why did Monica constantly want pastries? The elevator door dinged and opened, and Monica clicked her way inside before sliding a card into the panel and clicking a button. The elevator doors closed, shutting Ellie in with her fake boyfriend's ex-girlfriend. She swallowed, then shot Monica a fleeting smile. "'How long have you been together?' Monica asked suddenly, her voice as serious as her gaze. Ellie paused, surprised by Monica's directness. "'I'm not sure it's appropriate to discuss while we're working,' We try really hard to keep everything above reproach. 
Monica's gaze narrowed. Her dark ponytail had flipped over her shoulder and she was playing with the ends of it. Is it serious? She asked, ignoring Ellie's previous request completely. That is less appropriate than the last question, Ellie countered. Forgive my curiosity, Monica said as the elevator doors opened to reveal a hallway lined with doors. I only dated the man off and on for years, and all of a sudden he's got this brand new girlfriend that I've heard nothing about. Neither have any of his friends, she added with a sidelong glance before stepping into the hall. Ellie was grateful for the walk down the hall to gather her wits. When Monica let her into her office, Ellie stepped inside and took a seat. Well, that's probably because we've kept everything low-key. Brady didn't want to announce anything until he was sure it was going to work with Harver Allen. And I don't blame him, really. I'm just an intern. I wanted to be cautious as well. Monica clearly had a hard time swallowing the story Ellie was feeding her. She knew something was up or she wouldn't have questioned Brady's friends. In fact, we plan to tell everyone for Christmas, Ellie said. They wouldn't still be together by Christmas anyway. It was going to be a surprise. Monica's eyebrows lifted. At the Garrison family party? That's bold. Well, why not announce it with a splash? You haven't met the Garrisons, Monica said with a smug smile. Oh dear. The door opened and Brady stepped inside, taking a seat beside Ellie and dropping a paper bag on the desk. Monica finally lowered herself in the chair on the other side of the desk, leaning back and crossing one leg over the other knee. I was just hearing all about the big announcement, Monica said sweetly, reaching into the bag for a pastry. She lifted out a muffin and arched an eyebrow at him. It's what they had, Brady said unrepentantly. What big announcement? Did you settle on a charity? No, the big announcement you're planning to do at your family Christmas party. Brady turned confused eyes on Ellie, and she tried to convey her apologies through her own gaze, but she had a feeling he wasn't reading her mind. This was her fault, so she had to find a way to get them out of it. You know, about us, Ellie said smoothly. I mean, I know it wasn't meant to come out yet, but Monica won't tell anyone. Of course I won't, Monica added. Right, Brady said. Except that I thought we decided not to discuss our relationship during work hours, HR and all that. I tried. Exactly, Monica said. Let's get started on this charity. We are simultaneously raising money to go toward... Kids after school, Ellie said at once. Kids after school what? Monica asked. It's a program in the San Francisco school system that helps kids who are less fortunate have more exposure to the arts. They put together plays and have a special library program, Ellie explained. And they assist children who have English as a second language learn to read faster. That sounds worthy to me. Brady said, shrugging. And our patrons love those sorts of things. It always makes them feel like they've accomplished something, Monica said with no tact. Ellie was tempted to tell Monica that she had spent quite a few years in kids after school while her grandparents were both working. She wasn't ashamed of her less privileged upbringing, but she bit back the comment. Then let's give them plenty of opportunities to spend their money. Agreed, Brady said, shooting Ellie an amused smile. Now is that all we had to discuss? We better get back to the office. I assume we can leave the coordinating between kids after school and the museum to you? Absolutely, Monica said. I'll be sure to find their lead board members and issue them invitations as well. Wonderful, Brady said, rising. Ellie looked between them, certain her list of things to discuss was a mile long. But Brady seemed eager to go, so she got up and followed him out. The farewells were awkward, but they made it outside, where Brady let out a breath, like he'd been unable to breathe regularly indoors. So what exactly was all that about? He asked the moment they left the building. Neither Monica nor Brady had seemed to care about the charitable component to the gala, but Ellie did. And why not give back to a foundation which had helped her immensely as a child? I figured it was wise to choose a charity that really could use the money, she defended. No, not that. Yes, that sounds great. I am wholly in agreement with you on that. I meant the big announcement. Oh, that, Ellie said, rolling her eyes. Monica questioned your friends about me and wanted to know why you hadn't said anything about our relationship. She asked how serious we are and how long we've been dating, so I told her we were saving the news to make sure it was going to work out first. But my family party? He asked, his face pained. That was her. I just kind of agreed. He scrubbed a hand over his face and sighed. It's not possible. We can't do it. Ellie reached forward and grasped his arm. 
She doesn't have to know that. I wasn't actually intending on going to your family party and making a big announcement. We only have to pull this off until Christmas Eve anyway, and the gala is over. He leveled her with a look. Except that my family party is next week. Oh. And Monica is probably going, he added. Oh. Ellie dropped her arm. Yeah, Brady said. He turned for the street and flagged down a cab. She's really tight with my sister, who lives in Seattle, so every time Becky comes back to the bay to visit, we see a lot of Monica. Lovely. A cab stopped, and Brady slid in first this time, leaving the door open for Ellie. He gave the office address to the driver and leveled her with a look. So what are we going to do? I guess I'm coming to your family Christmas party. Chapter 8 Pepper was busier than usual that evening, and Brady slid into a booth as soon as another woman and her friend vacated it, despite the mess of drinks they'd left behind. Ben was supposed to meet him in another half hour, but he had work to do and could use a minute alone to gather his bearings. A man stepped up to his table to clear away the dishes, and a woman stopped by really quickly, saying, "'I'll be right with you,' before she disappeared again. He settled into his seat, glancing around the busy restaurant for any faces he might recognize." His gaze landed on Zane at the bar, and he turned away before the guy noticed him and they made eye contact. Brady was not in the mood to socialize with co-workers at present. Instead, he pulled out his phone and began sifting through emails he hadn't had time to reply to during work earlier that day. A few minutes went by before the waitress returned. She had a bright smile and frizzy black hair pulled up high on her head. What can I get for you? Brady ordered some dinner and went back to his phone after explaining that another man would be joining him shortly. His group family chat had been blowing up all day with everyone discussing the family Christmas party. He should tell them he was bringing a woman with him, but he just didn't know how to word it. Besides, they were all arguing between Mexican and Italian for dinner, like they did every year. And soon they would settle on Italian, like they did every year. He just needed to give them time to come to that conclusion again. When his food arrived, Ben followed shortly behind it. "'Are you coming to our gala?' Brady asked as his friend took a seat. I don't know, maybe, but you are not distracting me that easily, man, he said, a wide grin showcasing his perfect teeth. I heard you got yourself a girlfriend. How? Ben shrugged. Word gets around. Monica's been asking questions. Brady blew out a breath through his teeth. She works fast. So? Ben asked, leaving the question hanging. I took your advice, Brady said, shrugging. He winced. And I may have asked an intern to step in for a few short weeks? Ben's eyes bulged. That has to be against company policy. I'm breaking all the ethical rules these days, but I didn't know what else to do. And you know what? He added, smiling. It worked. The waitress returned and Ben ordered his own dinner before they were left in privacy again. Really? Ben said, picking up where they left off. Yeah, I wish I'd thought of this scheme last year when we got back together and I had to buy her that Prada bag as my apology gift. Ben just laughed. Brady gave a self-deprecating shake of his head. I've learned. And now you've got an intern girlfriend protecting you. Arching his eyebrow, Brady picked up his fork. Hey, it could be worse. Stepping into Pepper, Ellie was hit with the aroma of sizzling steak and too many people. She grazed the bar for a single open seat and caught one at the far end. Beelining her way toward the chair, she caught Kayla's attention across the floor and sent a little wave. Kayla was obviously swamped, but she would probably still manage a discount for Ellie. She was the best. Settling herself onto the bar chair, Ellie hung her purse on the back of the chair and turned to face forward, ordering a Coke and a steak, her favorite meal. Hey there, a man said to her left, and Ellie turned, surprised to find that she'd sat directly next to Zane from work. Her cheeks warmed. I didn't see you there, I've been distracted, she said with an awkward laugh. Zane flicked his wrist to shove aside her apology. It's fine. How was your second day? Better, she said. I didn't stomp my foot like a five-year-old in front of the entire design team, if that's what you mean. Zane's smile was understanding. It can be overwhelming starting a new job. It's overwhelming for me, and I've been here for over a year. Yikes, Ellie said. That's not what I want to hear. I'm sure it won't be the same for you. I just don't get much opportunity to show my abilities, so I'm always stuck on the menial jobs. She gazed into his dark brown eyes and read the resignation there. Have you tried to find a way to show them that you're capable of more than they are giving you? Yes, he said immediately. But it doesn't mean much if the boss isn't willing to give you a chance. Gaines? Brady. 
Oh, that was odd. Brady didn't seem like the sort of man to stunt a co-worker's growth intentionally. Unless there was a reason for it. Ellie asked, Do you have access to any of your designs now? I'd love to see them. Sure thing, Zane said. He pulled out his phone and swiped around for a moment before placing it on the bar in front of her. Ellie pulled it closer and swiped through the photos. Mock-ups for a large skyscraper with edgy, modern shapes and rows upon rows of shiny windows filled the screen. There was a center courtyard that was tastefully done, and a beautiful archway that led to the foyer. She was suitably impressed. Wow, this is amazing. Tell that to Brady, Zane said under his breath. She turned to face him. Why don't you? I've tried, he said, taking his phone back. He swiped through the photos as he spoke. I wanted to try and get this in the running for the new Bear Mobile building we've bid for, and he keeps putting off looking at it. I don't know why. The waiter slid a steaming plate in front of her on the bar, but Ellie ignored it, turning toward Zane and making her face as stern as she was able while she waited for him to slide his phone back in his pocket. Try one more time. That project deserves to be looked at. I don't know how they go about making decisions at Harvard Allen, but your design deserves a shot. Kayla sidled up between them right then, leaning on Ellie. We are so packed tonight she said, never-ending enthusiasm pouring from her. Ellie would hate working at such a busy steakhouse, but Kayla thrived off of it. Kayla, this is my friend Zane. We work together. Kayla turned toward him, her eyebrows raised in interest. Hi, Zane. You enjoying your steak? Yes, it's one of the best cuts I've ever had. I'll pass that on to the chefs. She gestured between Zane and Ellie. Did you two come together then? Zane shot Ellie a smile and she laughed. No, actually, it was just a funny coincidence. She turned to Kayla. Hey, when are you off? Want to watch the holiday tonight? Eleven and yes. Kayla turned to Zane. I gotta run. Nice to meet you. Kayla spun away before Zane could respond. She's fiery, he said, his eyes trailing Kayla as she checked on some tables along the far wall. And she's single, Ellie said. Zane's dark skin reddened with a blush, and Ellie turned back toward her plate. Cutting into her steak, she gave Zane a moment to cool down. They chatted about the people around the office and the quirky receptionist. She's hot and cold, Zane said. You have to figure out which side she's on that day, and then you'll know how much she's willing to do for you. Weird, Ellie said, finishing off her steak. I think I've gotten hot and cold from her on the same day, with crying in the middle. Pretty normal, Zane said, swigging his drink. Zane and Ellie, a voice said from behind them. They turned in unison. Brady stood just between their chairs, his hands slung casually in his pockets and a computer bag swung over his shoulder. This is a coincidence, Brady said, looking between them with suggestive eyes. Wow, so how do you know each other? Was he being serious? Ellie tilted her head to the side, lifting her soda to her lips for a drink. From work, Zane said. Brady nodded, his gaze jumping between them. Was he bothered to find them together? It was on the tip of Ellie's tongue to remind him that Monica was not in the vicinity, but she kept quiet. For all she knew, Monica was sitting at the other end of the bar. The bartender took Ellie's plate and left a bill. She busied herself pulling her wallet from her purse and sliding her card into the black billfold. Did either of you hear about the work ice skating party? Zane asked. Brady's judgmental expression shifted to amusement. Yeah, I heard about it. It's not like our normal activities. I don't think it's actually Harvard Allen Design sponsored at all, Zane said. I heard Cassie just threw it together and is calling it a work function so people will come. Ellie picked up her Coke, swigging the remainder of the soda. Good for her. Someone should promote coworker camaraderie. Brady's eyebrows lifted. Are you not finding Harvard Allen to your liking? Ellie rolled her eyes. I have no qualms with Harvard Allen. I just think it's great that Cassie is taking some initiative and we should all support her endeavors. Uh-huh, Brady said, nodding his head slowly. Well, I'll let you guys get back to your... He looked between them again. Anyway, see you at the office. Ellie smiled at him until he turned and left the restaurant. That was strange, Zane said. I saw him come in a while ago and I could swear he saw me too and then pretended not to. Well, I guess you were wrong. If he was pretending not to see you, he wouldn't have come over. Zane shot her a wry smile and Ellie scanned the room for Kayla. Her friend was busy chatting with a table on the other side of the room. I better get going, Ellie said, signing her check and sliding her card back into her wallet. I guess I'll see you at work. And don't forget, those designs deserve a shot. Zane shook his head. You're a force to be reckoned with, aren't you? I don't know if that's a compliment, Ellie said, but I'm planning to take it as one. Chapter 9 
Brady knew he was going crazy, but he couldn't help it. Monica had found a reason every single day over the last week to either drop by the office or give Brady a call on his personal cell phone. Each time she had an issue with the gala or a point she wished to discuss, he quickly drew Ellie into the meetings or phone calls. And he was glad for two reasons. Not only was Ellie keeping Monica at bay, but she was really good at her job. And not just as an intern. She was managing the entire event like a pro. He'd wondered more than once if architecture was really the correct path for her. But he was not her real boyfriend, so he made himself brush those thoughts away. And now it was Friday afternoon, and his family party was the very next evening. He'd messaged Ellie each time he remembered something he should warn her about, but it was becoming excessive. She probably thought him crazy. He couldn't blame her if she did. "'Hey, Mr. Garrison?' a voice asked, pulling him from his obsessive thinking about the family party and how they'd all react to the news about Ellie. "'The fake news.' He glanced up and caught Zane's deep brown puppy dog eyes watching him with reserve. "'Shoot.' He'd completely forgotten to look over Zane's proposal all week. I have just been swamped all week, Brady began, and I've got a lot going on this weekend. Send me a message first thing Monday to remind me and I'll look at them right away. We'll do, Zane said, turning back for his own desk. He tried to swallow his guilt. It had only been a week since the guy last asked, and Brady had a lot on his plate. He needed time. Besides, the Bear Mobile project wasn't happening for another month anyway. Pulling up his chat feature, Brady opened up a conversation with Ellie and typed, Brady Garrison, I should also warn you that my grandmother is completely blind. Ellie Shaw, I'm so glad you told me that. I'm certain I never would have figured it out when we actually met in person. Brady chuckled. He could hear Ellie's soft sarcasm tainting the words. Brady Garrison, Hey, I'm doing my best here to prepare you. Ellie Shaw, To join the CIA? Brady Garrison, to meet my crazy family. Elisha, everyone thinks their family is crazy. You need to take a cleansing breath and let it happen. It's the first time your girlfriend meets your family, Brady. There are bound to be quite a few introductions anyway. It's normal. She had a valid point. Brady Garrison, but my real girlfriend would have heard most of this in the course of our dating conversations. Elisha, and now I have. She was far too easygoing about what could possibly be a very emotionally scarring party. Ellie Shaw. I mean, come on, Brady. It's Christmas. Get into the holiday spirit a little here. Brady Garrison. You got it, boss. Ellie sent a few emojis of Christmas trees and Santa faces, and Brady had to smile. Brady Garrison. You found emojis. Way to go. Ellie sent an emoji of a fist waiting for a fist bump and a red 100 symbol. She was a firecracker, and so obviously smitten by the holiday. And he found that he enjoyed that about her very much. He sent back an emoji of a golden red wrapped gift, and she sent him a wink face. Ellie was capable of funny and quick-witted, and she was gorgeous, but that didn't really have any bearing on how his family would receive her. She was going to be fine at the party tomorrow. And Brady was so glad she'd agreed to go along with it, because Becky, his sister, had already texted him to warn him that Monica would be there which was a step above last time when he'd showed up to grandmother's 93rd birthday party and Monica was standing beside the drink table. Closing out the chat window, Brady forced himself to focus on work. Cassie sidled up to Ellie's desk just as she was closing out the chat window from Brady. The guy was a positive nuisance. Or he would be if his nerves weren't actually kind of adorable. He was so worried about the party that Ellie did her very best to put him at ease. She probably would have worried more had she not been so focused on helping ease Brady instead. So you're dating the boss, Cassie said, sitting on the edge of Ellie's desk and folding her arms across her chest, her lips tilting in a smug smile. Shh, no, I am not. Yes, you are, Cassie argued. I heard you two coming out of the elevator talking about the party and Brady Garrison's self-absorbed Uncle Roy. Ellie held the receptionist's gaze. Can you keep a secret? She'd never seen Cassie light up so quickly in the entire week and a half that she'd known her. You know I can! That was not the case. I know you like to gossip. Cassie actually looked hurt. I can keep a secret when it matters. So, telling the entire floor that Karen from Legal was having marital issues didn't matter? Ellie shook off the thought. She didn't really have a choice. If Cassie was on to them, then it was probably best to explain the truth to her instead of letting her believe the lie, because then the lie would undoubtedly spread, 
And really, the only person they needed to fool was Monica. You know how Brady and Monica used to be together? Ellie asked, lowering her voice. Cassie leaned in. Obviously. Well, he kind of panicked when we got put together to plan this gala. I stepped up and told her we were dating to keep her off his back. Cassie's eyes went wide with pleasure. And did she believe you? Yes. We have to keep it up until the gala is over, and then he won't need to see Monica again. Cassie scoffed. Good luck with that. The moment she finds out it's a scam, she'll be all over him again. Well, she's kept her distance recently, Ellie defended. It's just this project throwing them together now. Cassie didn't believe a word Ellie was saying if her expression was any clue. Whatever you say, but I have a feeling this band-aid isn't going to mend the broken arm. Huh? Ellie squinted, looking sideways at Cassie. Well, anyway, Cassie said, grinning. Did you hear about Harry from the bean downstairs? He totally ended up in the hospital after his electric scooter rammed him into the side of a building. Can you imagine? Writing so fast you actually get knocked out? Ellie looked on with horrified concern. Will he be all right? He's out now. He's the one who told me the story. Cassie stood and straightened her skirt, her short blonde hair swinging just above her shoulders. Well, that did make it a little better. Cassie regarded her with curiosity and finally leaned down. Listen, I won't tell a soul for now, but you need to keep me updated. Was that a threat or a simple request? Ellie nodded. If you don't tell anyone, I'd be happy to. Cassie's face broke out into a wide grin. Good. See you around. With a flicker of her fingers and a semblance of a wave, Cassie clicked back down the hall toward reception. It was not the end of the world that one person knew their secret. Right? Chapter 10 You are really going through with this? Kayla asked, leaning against the door jamb of Ellie's room with her arms crossed over her chest and an eyebrow cocked in disbelief. Yes, but what are you getting out of it? Ellie reached down and pulled on one sock before looking back at her roommate. It isn't that big of a deal. I'll go have some good food and maybe sing some carols and smile widely because I'm so in love. And then right after the gala, Brady will tell his whole family we broke up. But what about them? What if they love you? Ellie affected mock affront. If, of course they'll love me. I embody the spirit of Christmas, and who doesn't love Christmas? Ellie stood, showcasing her bright red jumper over a gold and white striped shirt and a long, thick black leggings. She shook her head to jingle her earrings and waited for Kayla's eye roll. I just don't understand why it's okay to lie to all these people for the sake of one woman. A ball of guilt formed deep in Ellie's stomach and weighed her down. It's not like that, Kayla. You know I'm trying to keep my boss from succumbing to her wily ways. He's a grown man, Kayla said, not amused. And he is not your responsibility. Except that I'm the one who said we were going to this party for the big announcement. I got us into this mess, so I have to see it through. Kayla watched her for a moment before pushing away from the door. Shaking her head slightly, she said, Have fun, and walked away. Well, that was an unfortunate way to begin the day. Ellie did her best to brush off the disappointment on her friend's face and took herself to the bathroom to get ready. Mascara and a simple ballerina bun tied with a red ribbon and she was ready to go. Except she didn't have any hosting gifts. Glancing at her watch, she was fairly sure she had enough time to run to the store and pick up a fresh bouquet of flowers and maybe a box of chocolates for Brady's mom. She threw her coat on and ran out of the apartment and down the stairs. Whole Foods was only two blocks away, and she was there in just a few short minutes. Bypassing the carts and baskets, she went straight for the flowers and selected a robust poinsettia in a green pot. Perfect. Turning for the registers, Ellie nearly ran into a green wire cart and used the edge of it to keep herself upright. She glanced up to the man pushing it and nearly laughed out loud upon recognizing Zane from the office. We've got to quit running into each other like this, Ellie said as if it wasn't the most overused joke of the century. Zane laughed politely. You look festive, he said, giving her outfit a once-over. I'm headed to a holiday party, she explained, lifting the plant as if that would help prove her suitability. Though I would dress this way all the time if I thought I could get away with it. You can definitely get away with it, Zane said, lifting his dark eyebrows. How did the meeting go with Brady? Ellie asked. Have you asked him about your designs? His gaze flicked away and his mouth closed in tight-lipped frustration. Shaking his head, he gave her a pitiful shrug. I don't think he'll ever look at them. 
He clearly has a lot going on, he hastened to add. And I know once the gala ends, then I won't have to struggle as much to get some of his time. But by then it might be too late to get your designs in front of Gaines. Exactly. Well, Ellie said, drawing the word out slowly. Maybe I can sneak into the office while everyone is gone and open them up on his tablet so he's forced to see them first thing Monday morning. Please do. They shared a smile. The guy was cute, and he deserved a fair chance. Not that those two things had anything to do with the other, of course. The side of her purse buzzed, and Ellie whipped out her phone to find a text from Brady. Where did you go? I've got my car waiting in the street. Shoot, I'm late. Ellie hugged her plant close to her. I'll see you Monday, Zane. Have fun at your party, he said with a half-smile. The guy deserved a chance, and she was going to get to the bottom of why Brady was so reluctant to give him one. She quickly typed a message back to Brady, telling him where she was. She paid for the plant and then ran out the door and down the sidewalk. A charcoal-colored Audi pulled up and honked, and Ellie leaned down to peek in the window before opening the door and sliding in. Brady looked at her as though she was disturbed. What is that? Ellie finished buckling her seatbelt and then settled the plant on her lap. What's this? It's a poinsettia. A small smile played at Brady's lips. Well, I know that. I mean, why do you have it here? It's a gift for your parents. He watched her for a moment, his blue eyes narrowing in consideration until the car honked behind them, which spurred Brady into action. He lifted a hand in apology to the car and swung into the road. They traveled toward Highway 101 and through the tunnel before the bridge. Mind if I turn on some music? Ellie asked, reaching toward the buttons on the dashboard. Sure. She turned on the radio and scanned it until she found a holiday station, pleased when they reached the Golden Gate Bridge, right as Bing Crosby's It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas began. Too bad it's so sunny today, she commented, turning the music up. It would probably feel more like Christmas if it was overcast. Brady cast her a sideways glance before looking back at the road. So how far is this place anyway? she asked. Just under an hour. Plenty of time for you to get all the Christmas out of your system before we arrive. That's a little backward, Ellie said. I think the music is meant to gear us up for the festivities. Okay, listen. I realize now that I've spent all my time preparing you for the people when I should have been preparing you for the party. He cleared his throat. We get together for my grandmother, but no one really wants to be there. It's a typical family party. Right. If anything, he'd made it more confusing. So, who knows I'm coming? Um, he said, looking away as he changed lanes. The final strains of Bing Crosby's song could be heard across the radio as Brady refused to speak. Brady, she said, turning to face him more fully. Tell me you at least warned them. He bared his teeth in an awkward smile. Oh, good gracious, Ellie said, sitting back in her seat and closing her eyes. This is going to be interesting. He did try to tell his mom he was bringing Ellie to the party, but she just wouldn't stop complaining about her sister long enough for him to get a word in. It's not for lack of trying, Brady defended. He refused to turn and look at Ellie, but he could feel the fire from her glare. He did feel bad, but what could he do about it now? On the positive side, my sister is bringing her fiancé, so you won't have to claim all of the spotlight alone. Great. Are you mad? He asked. No, it's fine. I'm sure it'll all work out. But before we arrive, I want to remind you of one major thing here. She was quiet long enough to warrant his attention, and Brady cast her a quick glance, surprised to find her staring at him. Yeah? I am doing you a favor, she said slowly. Yes, I am well aware. And I get nothing out of this except the opportunity to wear my new jumper. That's a pretty good trade-off, if you ask me. Brady hazarded another glance and found Ellie smiling, much to his relief. He liked her smile. A lot. It was far better than her disappointment any day. Brady discovered through that exchange how deeply he did not like disappointing Ellie. What Christmas traditions do you have? Brady asked, hoping to steer the conversation onto neutral waters. He saw Ellie shrug from his peripheral vision. For someone who loved the holidays so much, Brady did not expect her to close up about them at all. That doesn't seem very enthusiastic. Ellie stared at the poinsettia on her lap. My grandparents raised me, and everything was very low-key through my childhood. Brady wanted to ask what made it low-key, but he sensed that she would talk about it if she wanted to. Anything special you would do together? 
Just the normal things, she said, decorating the tree and baking cookies, watching White Christmas on Christmas Eve. Is it good? Is what good? Ellie asked. The movie. I've never seen it. What? Ellie all but yelled, and he was glad to have pivoted the conversation onto happier waters. You've never seen White Christmas? Are you even American? Brady chuckled. Yes. Well, then we need to rectify that right away. It's iconic, Brady. Ellie broke out into a song about sisters, laughing to herself, and Brady's chest warmed. Never, in all of his life, had he felt the desire to watch an old movie about Christmas, but suddenly he wanted to see it very much, as long as Ellie watched it with him. "'That'll be my payment for coming to this party,' Ellie said, looking pleased with herself. "'Once this party is over, you have to watch White Christmas with me.' Had she read his mind? He couldn't contain his grin. Deal. The road was long, but the trip seemed to pass quickly. Suddenly, they were surrounded by golden rolling hills dotted by trees and lined systematically with vines. "'Welcome to the wine country,' Brady said. "'It's gorgeous,' Ellie said reverently. "'I haven't been up here in ages. I forgot how beautiful it was.' "'Just wait until we get to my grandmother's house. The view is amazing.' Ellie grinned, reaching forward to turn up the radio once again. Brady relaxed into his seat and tapped his thumb along to the beat of Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You while Ellie sang along. If only this didn't have to end. If only he could drive around with Ellie all day and they didn't have to see his family. Blowing out a breath of negative energy, Brady allowed the music and Ellie's voice to wash over him as he enjoyed the final moments in the car. Chapter 11 Brady pulled into the half-circle driveway and parked behind his aunt's red Mercedes. He turned toward Ellie, holding her gaze. Are you ready? She grinned back at him, her face becoming even more beautiful at once. Come on, we've got this. Getting out of the car, Brady circled it to help Ellie out. He held her hand a moment longer than necessary and squeezed her fingers reassuringly. She looked up at him and said, It'll be fine. How is she so in tune to what he needed? He nodded his agreeance and locked his car, slipping the keys into his pocket before leading Ellie to the front door and inside the house. Hello, he said loudly. We're here. Finally, my baby has come. Brady's mom came around the corner, her arms outstretched for a hug. She had a long paisley skirt over sandals, and her wavy hair was loose and down to her waist. She stopped suddenly in the hallway, pulling her arms back as she registered that Brady was not alone. Mom, he said. Let me introduce my friend, Ellie. She blinked once, and then Ellie stepped forward. It's so good to meet you, Mrs. Garrison, she said, her cheerful voice matching the tone Brady's mom previously had. Ellie, his mom repeated. You can call me Sharon. Welcome to our home. Can I hug you? I'm afraid I'm a hugger. Ellie stepped forward and hugged his mom with one arm while she held the plant in the other, and Brady watched on with interest. It had been quite a while since he introduced his last girlfriend to his mom, but he vividly remembered Monica sticking a hand out to shake when Sharon had said the exact same thing. "'Well, should we go in?' Brady asked, eager to get the introductions over with. His mom shot him a curious glance, which he promptly ignored. "'Why don't you take Ellie's coat first and be the gentleman I raised you to be?' She had a point. He slid his hand over Ellie's shoulders and took her coat from her arms as she shrugged out of it, revealing a cute red dress thing with overall buttons. Was this what she called a jumper? She looked so festive it lit a small smile on his mouth. Thanks, Ellie said. Sharon, I've brought this for you. Brady swallowed a laugh at his mother's expression. One would assume she'd never been gifted a plant before. Maybe she hadn't. How cute, Sharon finally said. Let's go in. She turned away and carried the plant into the living room. You hear that, boyfriend? Ellie said quietly over her shoulder. Let's go in. Brady slid his hand onto the small of Ellie's back and reminded himself, We are dating. Then he took a deep breath and led Ellie into the large living room. Monica was sitting on the sofa between Grandmother and Becky, her smile smug and her eyebrows raised. She stood, crossing the room toward them. Ellie, Monica said as though the two were lifelong friends, how sweet that you could make it. The look on Ellie's face was a mixture of surprise and disgust and Brady had to swallow a laugh. Was she as taken aback as he was by Monica's warm demeanor? She certainly appeared so. Monica, Ellie said simply. She turned her attention toward the remainder of the room and lifted a hand in a general wave. Hello, everyone. I'm Ellie. 
Brady glanced around the room, taking in his grandmother's tilted head, as though she angled her ears to hear what her eyes could not show her. His sister's interested but knowing smile proved she had heard the whole of it from Monica earlier. Beside them, propped against the armrest, was Chad, Becky's fiancé, and in the two wing-back chairs set against the windows were his dad and his uncle Ray, their gazes fixed on the TV. Ellie received a few greetings before Brady introduced her to each person one by one, saving his grandmother for last. "'Where's Aunt Shelby?' he asked once they reached grandmother, perched on the edge of the sofa cushion daintily. "'In the kitchen. I am sure you'll be surprised, though I can assure you it is nothing on my shock, young man, but Shelby has determined to make a pie for dinner this year.' "'Isn't it catered? I thought everyone settled on Italian.' "'The rest of dinner is,' grandmother said." but I don't wish to discuss our food right now. She turned her attention to Ellie standing beside Brady, as though she knew exactly where she was. I want to meet this lovely young woman. Ellie laughed, and the sound was a tinkling, magical sound. You can't possibly know that I'm lovely, but thank you for the compliment all the same. I can, Grandmother countered. I can tell from your tone of voice and the way you talk. Let's hope you're better for my grandson than the last hussy he brought home. Ellie shot Brady a look full of concern, her cheeks going ruddy, as she did her best, most likely, to avoid catching Monica's eye. The room went silent except for the sound of whistles and crowds on the TV. Grandmother patted the cushion beside her where Monica had been seated when they first stepped into the room. Come sit by me and tell me a little about yourself. Are you a redhead? I am a natural blonde, Ellie said, and I go to a salon to make it even blonder. A smile broke out on Grandmother's face and Brady felt that Ellie would be all right. He left the room before he could be sucked into the conversation, and found his aunt and mother together at the stove poking at something. "'Making a pie?' Brady asked. Aunt Shelby spun around, a knife in her hand and rosy cheeks evidence of her work. "'This is why I pay someone else to do it. I'm failing miserably. But I had to go and watch the Food Network while my foot healed, and now I feel capable of making a pie!' "'I'm sure it'll taste great,' Brady said, glancing behind her to the mess in the pie dish waiting on the stove." Don't worry, Mom said, holding her phone to her ear. I've got Marie calendars on the line right now. I'm going to find out about- Oh, yes, hello. How many pies do you have available? Uh-huh. And what kinds are they? Her voice trailed off as she walked into the other room. Brady reached into the cupboard for a glass and filled it with water from the fridge, downing it in gulps. Nervous? Aunt Shelby asked, a cat-like smile on her lips. No. She didn't look as if she believed him. Her dark hair was curled away from her face and her apron barely concealed her designer suit. She did not look like she belonged in this kitchen, even with flour on her cheek. "'So who's the woman?' she asked. "'Ellie Shaw. You want to come meet her?' "'And how long have you two been together?' Brady refilled his glass and downed it again. "'A little while.' Aunt Shelby rolled her eyes. "'Men,' she said with a little laugh. Now I want to hear about this gala you're putting together with Monica. I've heard from Gilbert Farr Associates that they've received an invitation already. Where's mine? Are you prepared to drop massive amounts of money to teach inner city kids to read? Her mouth formed a smile. I can make that happen. Brady nodded. Then I'll have my assistant send you an invitation Monday. Mom stepped back into the room. Ordered the pies. Who wants to pick them up? I can. Becky said brightly from behind Brady, hovering in the doorway between the living room and kitchen. She turned back toward the family. Monica, you want to come? Brady, you can watch over Chad for a minute, right? She added facetiously. Sure thing. Great. Becky turned back again. Hey, Ellie, you want to join us? Ellie brought her head up, a smile already adorning her face from whatever she had been discussing with grandmother. She looked to Brady for help, and he said, Actually, I'd rather she stay with me. Why? Becky asked with typical attitude, her dark bangs falling over her eyes. Brady shared a smile with Ellie over his sister's shoulder. To protect her, obviously. He was hoping everyone else interpreted the smile as a sweet look between them, when really they were both trying to figure out how to keep Ellie from a car ride with his nosy sister and crazy ex-girlfriend. Aww, Aunt Shelby said, coming to the rescue. Can't you tell they're in love? Ellie's eyes widened imperceptibly, and Brady's smile grew. Yeah, Becky, quit trying to get Ellie alone for an inquisition and go pick up the pies. Becky speared him with a look. Fine, but when I get back, we're playing charades, and don't think you're getting out of it. Brady wanted to groan. To his dismay, Ellie actually looked excited. 
Then she looked to grandmother as though it had just dawned on her that the older, blind woman would be incapable of playing charades. Ellie's compassion was beautiful. Warmth began in his chest and spread down through his body as Brady watched Ellie interact with his grandmother. She was a light, and she was brilliant in her capacity at work and with other people. He saw it all the time as she interacted with coworkers. He needed to be careful, or he was going to develop real feelings for his fake girlfriend. Chapter 12 Brady's family wasn't that odd. Sure, his aunt and uncle looked like they rolled out of a Mercedes commercial, and his mom and dad looked like they sold tomatoes at the local farmer's market in their spare time, but his grandmother was lovely, and his sister and her fiancé weren't too bad. Nosy, of course, but who wouldn't be in this situation? And then there was Monica. When Brady explained that his ex-girlfriend was coming to the party, Ellie expected it to be a large event with lots of extended family and second cousins he only saw every so often. But this was intimate. It was close family. They must really love Monica to include her in something so small. Ellie swallowed. She knew she could never measure up to Monica's perfection. The woman was wearing the most exquisite cream-colored blouse over a pair of designer pants that Ellie was too afraid to get near in case she accidentally brushed against them with her cheap red jumper and ruined them with the velvet fuzz. She never felt as childish or dowdy as she did when she measured herself against the smooth, chic being that was Monica. It was very clear to Ellie how Brady found himself going back to the woman time and again. Her gaze drifted across the floor to where Brady sat near his dad and uncle, with his soon-to-be brother-in-law on the other side. They were laughing about something to do with the football game, but Ellie could never guess what it was. Did Brady know how handsome he was when he laughed like that? Like all of the cares in the world were irrelevant at that moment. Ellie loved when he let go so easily. Well, Ellie and the fake relationship loved it. Once all of this was over and he went back to being her boss, real Ellie couldn't allow herself to have those feelings. Because in real life, HR probably would not be so chill about the two of them dating. And she really loved working for Harvard Allen. So far, anyway. Hey, Ellie! Chad hollered across the room, stealing her attention. What do you say, 49ers or the Redskins? I like the Giants, she said back with a simple shrug. Chad looked horrified. New York? No, San Francisco. Chad broke into laughter. Hey, Brady, you've got to teach your woman the difference between baseball and football. My woman can throw a gala together in under a week. I don't care if she knows the difference between a goal and a home run. She's brilliant. Ellie's chest warmed. He'd called her brilliant. And my woman. Even if it was fake, she liked being called his. And besides, she added, baseball is better than football any day. The men all looked at her as though she was a species they did not understand. Except for Brady. He simply looked amused. Well, the women are in the kitchen, Roy said in dismissal. Ellie tried not to immediately dislike Brady's uncle because of his sexist comment and turned toward Brady's grandmother. Beverly? she said, as the older woman had asked her to do when they first met. I'll never understand sports. Beverly's wrinkled face creased in a smile. And they will never understand how you can feel that way. It is their common thread, you understand. There is nothing else which ties those men together. Aside from being related, Ellie said. The older woman shook her head. Even then, they've never gotten along so perfectly. My daughters are very different, and their husbands are even more so. Ellie's gaze floated back to the men. Brady never mentioned any cousins. Beverly turned her neck to face Ellie, though her cloudy eyes evidenced that she could not see. Shelby and Roy never had children. I have two grandchildren to my name, and they are both here today. Ellie reached forward and took Beverly's hand, squeezing her fingers. How lovely to have all of your family together for the holidays. It would be even better if any of them bothered to decorate she said, surprising Ellie. They think I don't know because I'm blind now, but I'll let you in on a secret. I'm not stupid. Ellie couldn't help but grin. Obviously. Beverly continued. And I can still smell and feel things quite well. I can tell that my tree is missing, and the holly garland, which usually sits on the mantle. I know they have not set out my small village on fake snow. I've lived my entire life in Northern California, Ellie. The only way I've had snow at Christmas is in my tiny little ceramic town. An idea struck Ellie and she glanced around, pausing when her gaze landed on Brady. He was watching her intently, a focused look on his brow. 
Would he be angry if she moved forward with her plan? What did it matter? This woman wanted Christmas, and Ellie was going to do her best to give it to her. Where do you keep your decorations? Ellie asked softly. The woman paused. She truly wasn't stupid if she could tell from one small question precisely what Ellie intended to do. And Ellie had a feeling Beverly knew exactly what she was planning. In the attic, she said. I've always been quite organized, you understand. But even I cannot keep the dust from boxes which have sat untouched for the last decade. I understand. Now where do I find the attic entrance? In the ceiling of the hallway upstairs. You'll know it when you see it. Patting Beverly's hand, Ellie rose and left the room without so much as a backward glance. She'd felt Brady's gaze on her, but forged ahead. The staircase was just by the front door, and Ellie trailed her hand along the polished oak railing as she climbed to the second story. Locating the attic entrance was easy enough, and she unhooked the string from the wall and pulled down, revealing a fair amount of cobwebs and a pull-down ladder. Once she got the ladder to the floor, she straightened, jumping at the voice just behind her. "'What are you up to?' Spinning, she gave Brady a guiltless smile. I am setting up Christmas for Beverly. He could not look more confused than if Ellie had been wearing a Santa hat and announced that she was headed to the North Pole. You realize my grandmother is blind, right? And you realize she isn't stupid, right? They stared at each other a moment, until Brady shook his head. Are you trying to ruffle some feathers, Ellie? She propped her hands on her hips. No, I am trying to give your grandmother her snow-covered tiny village that she's lived without for the last ten years because you're all too lazy to set it up for her. She might not be able to see the decorations, but that doesn't mean she can't feel their lack. Fine, he said, his hands up in surrender. I think it's pointless, but you clearly care a lot about this. So let me help. That's exactly what I want, Ellie said as she began climbing the ladder. A reluctant assistant. Brady's chuckles wafted up and wrapped around her heart, and Ellie did her best to ignore the feelings he evoked in her chest. Beverly hadn't been kidding about her attic. It was very well organized, stacks of boxes sat together, neatly labeled, and separated enough from each other to indicate which piles belonged together. It took the two of them no more than twenty minutes to locate the boxes labeled Christmas and stack them near the attic entrance. They developed a system where Brady stood on the ladder and handed boxes down to Ellie, where she stacked them again in the hallway. The front door opened below them just as Brady was putting the ladder back into the ceiling. Becky and Monica came in, laughing and carrying pastry boxes with the familiar Marie Callender's logo on top. What are you guys up to? Becky asked, noticing them. She lifted an eyebrow and her lips smirked accordingly. Just setting up Christmas, Ellie said as though it were the most normal thing in the world for her to do in a stranger's home during their family party. The women both cast curious, unsure glances at them before turning for the kitchen. Ellie spun to face Brady and found him standing just behind her. Her elbow knocked him in the chest and she lifted a hand to press against where she'd smacked him, saying, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were right there. I'm fine, he said softly, his gaze never leaving her own. She pulled her hand away, realizing belatedly the intimacy of its placement. Do you want to set up the tree while I get working on the village? Beverly has labeled everything so well I'm sure it won't take us long. I can do that, he said, his voice low with intensity. How did he manage to make such an innocuous sentence sound so heady? Great, Ellie said with added enthusiasm. She moved to step around him and brushed his arm, her own tingling from the contact. What in the world had gotten into her? Brady was attractive, she'd never denied that. But the pull she felt toward him today was beyond the simple knowledge that he was a handsome guy. It was like a current moved between them now, and she could feel how close or far he was from her. She wanted to close the gap and see what sort of electricity erupted, but that was out of the question. She was the one who made it out of the question with her no-kissing rule. She needed to snap out of it. Hefting the box titled Village One in her arms, Ellie turned for the stairs and carried the box downstairs. She set it on the floor as she walked the remainder of the rooms and found, much to her delight, a room off to the right of the front door that seemed to act as a sort of family room. It had two sofas and a fireplace, a perfect place for the tree, and a bureau set against the wall that could easily be cleared off and covered in fake snow and tiny houses. How did you know this was where Grandmother always put her tree? Brady asked, carrying a large box containing the Christmas tree. Because Beverly was the sort of woman who seemed like she liked a cozy Christmas. Swallowing that reply so as not to sound too obnoxious, Ellie said, I just thought it would work nicely in here. 
Brady regarded her a moment before kneeling down to begin untaping the tree box. It's like you've got Christmas intuition or something, he said. Ellie grinned, moving over to the bureau and hiding the trinkets on top within its cupboards. Didn't you know? she said playfully. I'm one of Santa's elves. Chapter 13 Brady could certainly believe that Ellie was sent straight from the North Pole. It took her just over an hour to get the entirety of the small ceramic village set up, fake snow and all, along with the garland trailing the mantles in each of the main living rooms and down the banister. She had turned some holiday music on her phone and played it loudly while they hung ornaments on the pre-lit tree side by side, and Brady found himself soaking in every moment of the traditional Christmas decorating they were doing together. The boxes all sat strewn at the bottom of the staircase, ready to be put away for the next few weeks, and Brady stood there, watching Ellie carry in the last of the boxes and setting it on top of the pile. She opened the lid and quickly pulled something out, smiling mischievously in a way that caused Brady's stomach to flip. "'I found something fun,' she whispered, "'and I think we should hang it up without anyone knowing.' Ellie pulled her hand from behind her back to reveal a small sprig of fake mistletoe, tied together with a red velvet ribbon and dotted by shiny red plastic berries. It was all too familiar to Brady, for he remembered watching his grandparents pause beneath it and steal a kiss when he was a small boy. He thought it was gross at the time, but now he recognized their actions as sweet. But Ellie had decreed at the start of their fake relationship that there would be no kissing. Was this her way of going back on that rule? He lifted an eyebrow at her and she rolled her eyes in exasperation. Not for us, obviously, but there are three other couples in this house. Come on, she said, grabbing onto his forearm. It could be fun. Where should we put it? Maybe over the front door? We'll just have to stagger our exits. Deal, Ellie said, spinning toward the door. She pulled a chair with her to the doorway and stepped onto the seat. Using one of the tacks Brady had acquired to hang up some garland over the family room doorway, she secured it right in the center. Once the mistletoe was placed, Ellie turned to Brady and offered him a wink. She was glowing, and her love for the holiday was becoming infectious. He couldn't remember the last time he'd enjoyed setting up for Christmas, but doing so with Ellie, he didn't want it to end. And for all of his concerns and anxiety leading up to this party, his family had actually been pretty well behaved so far. But I don't want to worry about my retirement yet, Shelby. There's a reason I'm still working at the cafe. I like my job. And there it was. Ellie cast him a confused look, but he simply put on a brave face. Let's get everything back into the attic. She agreed, and they worked silently together to complete the task, as his mom and aunt could be heard arguing in the kitchen about the respectability of working as a waitress when one was above 60 years old. I'm happy, Shelby, his mom shouted. Just accept it and move on. Not everyone has to have a Mercedes in their driveway to consider themselves success. But if you had the luxuries of life, then you wouldn't feel that way. But I don't, mom countered. So what does it matter? I know this is really difficult for you to believe, but not everyone wants to be you. Shelby scoffed and her heels clicked as she stormed away from the living room. Brady and Ellie paused in the hallway as Shelby came toward them, turned for the door and walked outside, slamming it behind her. Welcome to the family party I am used to, he said. Ellie shot Brady a sad smile and took his arm. Come on, let's get that game of charades going. They stepped back into the room to find the men and grandmother seated exactly where they had left them over an hour before. The only difference to the room now was Monica and Becky sitting on the sofa besides grandmother, and Mom sitting on a chair by the window, looking outside with a scowl on her face. "'Who wants to play charades?' Brady asked. "'I'm up for anything,' Monica said right away. "'Maybe we should eat first. Roy said, patting himself in the belly. "'The game just ended, and I'm starving.' Was he ignorant that his wife had just stormed outside after fighting with her sister? Brady turned his attention to his grandmother. Ellie spoke before he could get a word out. Beverly, what would you like to do? The food is likely ready and the table is already set. Roy, why don't you fetch your wife from the car and we can eat? Sharon, she said, turning to where her daughter was seated beside the window. Begin pulling trays from the oven, dear. Okay, Mom. Sharon got up and went into the kitchen, a frown adorning her lips. It was a process getting the food on the table and everyone in the proper seat. Adjustments had to be made to move Sharon and Shelby to opposite ends of the table, and somehow Monica had been placed next to Brady instead of Ellie, but since the name cards were done up in Becky's handwriting, that wasn't such a shock. His sister loved throwing a wrench into things. Brady helped Ellie into the seat beside him, 
He switched the name cards back so Monica was across from them and ignored her scowl. They feasted on an array of Italian food, as they did every year, and aside from the sisters giving one another cold shoulders, the remainder of dinner went smoothly. The pies were brought out and spread across the table with servers placed near each of them. So, Ellie, Becky began as she cut a slice of pecan pie. Tell us how you met my brother. Funny story, actually, Ellie said, shooting Brady a glance. But I'd rather tell it, Brady cut in. I believe it's funnier from my perspective. Ellie looked confused, but he couldn't let her continue. She'd mentioned once that they had a cute first meeting story, and he knew she was going to tell everyone about how she spit his drink all over the conference room floor. But Monica had been in that meeting, and if Ellie shared it now, then Monica would know how fresh and young their so-called relationship was. Swallowing, he racked his brain for an idea. Well, he began... We both work for Harvard Allen, and one day when I was coming up the elevator, Ellie yelled at me to hold the door open for her. So I did, and I waited for her to run across the lobby and leap inside. The thing is, she was going so fast that she leapt right at me, and I had to let go of the doors and grab onto her to keep both of us from falling to the floor. Were you successful? Becky asked, her head tilted to the side as she lapped up the story he was creating. He hazarded a glance at Ellie beside him and found her looking impressed no doubt with his ability to lie on a dime. Not necessarily something he was proud of, but certainly something that was benefiting them in the moment. Brady smiled at his fake girlfriend, picturing the scenario in his mind with favorable feelings. I think I was successful. I snatched her up, didn't I? That was actually pretty cute, Becky relented. Brady turned toward her and caught Monica's scowl just before it disappeared. And what did you think of him? Becky asked Ellie. She turned toward Brady and sent him a saucy smile. I thought, this guy is cute, but he really needs to let go of me right now. The table erupted in laughter and Ellie grinned. Brady found her smile warming his heart, and he had to look down at the pie his dad was passing him to refocus himself. This was not real. Ellie was not his real girlfriend. He felt Ellie's hand rest on his knee under the table and give it a gentle squeeze before she released him. Was she trying to remind him that their relationship was fake? He got the message. Why don't you and Chad share your story now? Brady said, spurring more laughter. They went on to explain how they met in Seattle at a pier. Becky's dog was doing his best to get away from her to chase a much larger dog, and Chad had come to the rescue, grabbing onto the leash before the little terrier could run away completely. Once the other dog had gone a safe distance, Becky's terrier calmed down and Becky and Chad were able to talk, exchanged phone numbers, and the rest was history. I think you have the sweetest story ever, and I simply cannot wait to be the maid of honor in your wedding this summer, Monica announced, shocking the rest of the room into silence. This summer? Sharon asked, her fork suspended midair with a bite of banana cream pie sitting precariously at the end of it. I thought you wanted to wait another year. Becky glanced at Chad and then directed her attention to her mom. We don't want to wait that long. I've already got the dress and we've begun looking at venues, so we figured we would just move it up a little. A little? Sharon turned to her husband for probably the first time that evening, that Brady had noticed at least, and stared at him. Did you know about this? Brady's dad had just shoved a bite of pie into his mouth and was busy chewing, his eyes wide and his bushy brows lifted as high as they could possibly go on his forehead. When he finally swallowed, he said, well, Of course I didn't know about it. Well, I'm glad I know now so I can help out, Sharon said, eyeing Monica with irritation. She went to take a bite of her pie, but it had plopped onto the plate below it, and disappointment was evident across her features as an empty fork entered her mouth. I am pleased you'll have a summer wedding, Grandmother said from the end of the table. Now shall we adjourn, so we might show Ellie how talented we all are at making fools of ourselves? The general grumpy consensus was yes, and the group stood to go. Ellie stood quickly, grabbing Brady by the sleeve of his shirt. I'm taking Beverly to the family room. You coming? The look of excitement evident on her features was enough to entice Brady to do anything she wished. His throat went dry and he nodded. Good, she said, before moving down to the end of the table and speaking quietly to his grandmother. If there was one thing Brady knew for sure, it was that this woman was in grave danger of making him develop very real feelings for her. Chapter 14 Beverly agreed to allow Ellie to lead her into the family room, and the moment they crossed over the threshold, Ellie felt the older woman's shoulders relax. She turned and grasped Ellie's hand, squeezing it with both of her own. With eyes suspiciously shiny, she said, Oh, it is just lovely. 
Odd, since the woman could not see, but Ellie knew that the spirit of Christmas was more than just the trees and presents and beautiful garlands. It was the feelings, and in this room, the spirit of Christmas could be felt in droves. I can just imagine exactly how it looks, Beverly said. She pointed toward the corner of the room. My tree is over there, yes? Yes, Ellie said. Brady stepped past them and leaned against the wall, his hands in his pockets as he watched the interaction. And my village? On the bureau, just over there, Ellie said, leading Beverly toward the tiny ceramic village set over a roll of fake fluffy snow. Beverly took her time examining the setup with her fingers, the smile never slipping from her face. Brady took Ellie by the hand and led her toward the sofa, indicating silently that they should give his grandmother some space. They sat beside one another, and Ellie's heart glowed. Even as the men could be heard in the other room shouting at the TV again, another game was on? Really? Ellie could feel the magic in the small room. When Beverly finally turned toward them, Brady hopped up to lead her to the end of the sofa. You set it up entirely wrong, Beverly said, coming to sit down. But that is not a bad thing. It was interesting to see how someone else might think the bakery belongs beside the library. I suppose there could be worse things than smelling fresh baked bread whilst sitting to read. Ellie chuckled. Please forgive me. It is perfect. I don't know if Brady told you, but my sweet husband gave me this village piece by piece. Ellie glanced to Brady, but his eyebrows were raised and his head shaking, giving her the impression that he was unaware of that tidbit of information. He gave me a small house and a few trees for our very first Christmas, and then added to it every year. It has been my favorite tradition, and I've cherished that tiny town. Thank you for getting it out of the attic and dusting it off. I had a mind to try and find it myself, but better sense prevailed. Ellie laughed. I am so glad I was able to haul it out for you. Brady and I made a good team. Of that, Beverly said, I can certainly agree. Mom, Shelby called, coming down the hall. She paused in the doorway, her gaze flickering around the room, and then to the occupants, irritation in her eyes. Who's going to put all of this away? Was that why they quit decorating? No one wanted to be responsible for the takedown? I will, Ellie said, trying to cover the bite in her tone. I'll come back up on New Year's Day. I've got nothing else going on that day. Great, Shelby said flatly. Are we playing charades or not? Actually, I think it is best if I call it a night, Beverly said, rising. Brady jumped up to assist her. She leaned over and whispered, Best to end the evening on a high note. Ellie agreed, wholeheartedly. Shelby turned back for the other room and walked away while Brady led his grandmother to the foyer. Would you like to say goodnight to everyone first? he asked. No, she said. I will see most of them in the morning. But good night, Ellie. I hope we see more of you. Ellie hugged Beverly, her heart tugging. She wished for the same, but it wasn't realistic. I'll see you New Year's Day, she said. That was the least she could do, even after Brady and she pretend broke up. Yes, you will, Beverly replied. She turned for the stairs and made it halfway up before pausing. Brady and Ellie stood in the foyer, waiting for her to make it all the way up. "'Where did you hang my mistletoe?' she asked. Ellie stilled. She looked up and found the sprig tacked securely above their heads. She shared a look with Brady before his gaze flickered down to her lips. Well, Beverly was blind. They could get away with one small lie. A voice came from the end of the hall, startling both of them. Monica, standing with her arms crossed over her chest and a frown on her mouth, said, it's directly above their heads. Ellie looked at Brady, trying to gauge where he was at, but found his eyes settled on her lips once more. It was she who made the rule of no kissing, and she knew Brady well enough now to realize he was not going to break that rule first. He respected her too much. Instead, Ellie said, Oh look, you're right. Lucky us. Brady's arm snaked around her back, applying pressure with his hand and drawing her closer. His demeanor became serious, and he whispered, is this okay with you? Ellie gave the slightest of nods and her body hummed. Lifting her face toward his, she waited as Brady lowered his head and pressed his lips against hers. And just as she'd imagined, explosions went off all around her as they kissed. Electricity ran like a current from Brady's lips to her heart, and Ellie reached up and slid her hands around his neck to pull him closer. 
A throat cleared down the hall and they broke apart suddenly. Oh, young love, Beverly said, trailing her hand along the banister as she continued up the stairs, a smile on her lips. Monica's voice did not hold any of the sweetness Beverly had when she said, I was coming to ask if I could grab a ride back to the city. Becky and Chad brought me up here, but they're planning to stick around for a few days. Cool rushed over her body like a bucket of ice water, effectively drawing Ellie back into the present. Sure, Brady said, resigned. He led Ellie into the living room to give their farewells, and both of his parents stood to hug him goodbye. Ellie was unsure if his dad even realized who she was or the fake significance of her presence, but he didn't seem to care. And that was fine by her. They left Sharon and Shelby sitting at opposite ends of the sofa, both questioning Becky about her wedding plans, and Ellie was glad to get out of there. "'This is great,' Ellie said as they made their way outside into the cool evening toward Brady's Audi. "'Maybe we can chat about the tablecloth vendor on our way home. I haven't heard anything from them all week, so I'm thinking we need to go with a different company.' Monica rolled her eyes before stepping in front of Ellie and sliding into the front seat of the car. "'Figure it out Monday. I don't work on the weekends.' Brady stood at the driver's side door, glancing between Ellie and the car where Monica had seated herself. He lifted one shoulder in a helpless shrug and mouthed, Car sickness. Ellie got into the back seat. It didn't really matter anyway. The ride back to the city was long and drawn out. Monica spent every moment talking to Brady about mutual acquaintances or shared holiday memories, and Ellie wanted to slip into the floor. The woman was doing her best to retaliate after the horribly boring family party and, most likely, being forced to witness them kiss. But it was worth it, even for her incessant chatting. The sun set over the rolling hills and vineyards and Ellie watched out the window at the mesmerizing view. By the time they reached the Golden Gate Bridge, Monica's monologue had slowed and they entered San Francisco in relative silence. Ellie didn't know what to think when Brady drove straight to Monica's apartment and dropped her off without need for directions, but it was excusable. They had dated for a long time. And she wasn't actually dating him anyway. When Monica slid out of the car, she didn't so much as wave, and Ellie got out to sit in the front seat. White Christmas? she asked. Brady turned his head to look at her. Yes. Chapter 15 what did it mean when a woman asked Brady to watch a movie with her and then promptly fell asleep? He sat through the whole of it, and though he wouldn't be able to honestly say that he loved it as much as Ellie did, he could give it a solid four-star review. But really, the singing did make the movie great. About one-third of the way through the movie, Ellie had slipped down until her head rested on his arm. Her roommate had said goodbye then, because she was on her way out, and brought him a blanket to lay over Ellie, but she hadn't seemed to think he needed to wake her up and he didn't want to. Ellie looked like a peaceful angel, and after what she had done for his grandmother earlier that day, he wouldn't be surprised if she was hiding wings under her jumper and a halo somewhere in her hair. She stirred, her nose scrunching up as lines formed on the sides of her eyes. Hey, he said softly, trying to remind her gently that she was not alone. He glanced around her small but well-decorated apartment. She really, truly loved this holiday. Did I miss the whole thing? She asked, her voice sleepy. Shucks. Yeah, Brady said, stretching out his arm where it had fallen asleep. But I'm glad to say I liked it. She looked at him with mock indignation. Just liked it? You didn't adore it? I liked it, he repeated. Her gaze narrowed as she watched him a moment longer. And what sort of things do you love, Brady Garrison? This was getting awfully personal for a fake relationship. He leaned his head on the back of the sofa and looked at the twinkle lights Ellie had strung around the ceiling. My job, he finally said. I love my job, and I'm good at it. Hey, speaking of work, what did you think of Zane's ideas? Brady froze. Where was this coming from? For the gala? To be honest, they were mediocre. It was nothing an intern couldn't come up with. She shot him a look. I'll try not to be offended by that. He hadn't meant it that way. He often forgot Ellie was an intern. She was so good at what she did. I just meant they were at a very primary level. Well, maybe that's because he didn't take a job designing galas. He took the job to design buildings. And he's pretty good, in my opinion. Someday, maybe. For now, he has a lot of growing to do. Ellie sat back on the sofa and surveyed him closer. You haven't even looked at his designs yet, have you? I have been swamped. 
Ellie shook her head, and the disappointment in her eyes was enough to draw an arrow through his heart. Why hadn't he just glanced through Zane's designs? Then he could at least break down why they weren't great. But he hadn't expected to be questioned by his fake girlfriend on their somewhat real date. Was this a real date? Or was it simply research? I told him I'd look first thing Monday. Great. I hope you do. I will. Great, Ellie repeated, causing irritation to form within Brady's stomach. Listen, he said. We might be fake dating, but I'm still the head of design at Harbor Allen, and if I don't think Zane is ready to take on any huge projects, then you just need to trust me on this. I know what I'm doing. Ellie held his gaze for a moment before drawing herself up to a stand. Consider it noted. I guess I'll see you for the meeting with Gaines Monday morning? I'll try not to spit my drink all over the floor this time. That was his cue to leave. Standing, he did his best to salvage the night and dispel the awkward feeling between them. Offering her a smile, he said, Thank you for what you did today. I know my family isn't super warm or welcoming, but my grandmother appreciated it. It was worth it, she said. For her. Brady took himself to the door. Good night, Ellie. Good night. First thing Monday morning, Brady opened up his tablet and located the email from Zane. He'd gotten to the office a few minutes early and was alone in the design room to give himself plenty of time to look at Zane's email without any watchful eyes. Drawing in a deep breath, he opened the email and enlarged the attached images. Well, this was just great. He'd been prepared to hate Zane's ideas, when in reality, what he felt was just the opposite. He slid through the images one at a time, impressed by Zane's vision and attention to detail. By the time he reached the final mock-up, a detailed design of the courtyard garden, he felt like an idiot for not giving Zane a better chance earlier. Pulling up a new email, he forwarded the designs to Gaines with a brief description of what they were meant for and who came up with them. By the time he'd completed the task, people had begun trickling into the office. Now he had to figure out how he was going to tell Zane. Chapter 16 Things were stilted between Brady and Ellie for the next few days, he hadn't been cold toward her, exactly, but he'd been sure to treat her like the coworker she was. Not that it mattered. It was a safe idea after the boundaries they'd crossed under the mistletoe at his grandmother's house. But that didn't mean it was fun for her. Ellie had an afternoon meeting with the founders of Kids After School, so she closed up her computer and gathered her things. Pausing by reception on her way out of the office, Ellie leaned against the computer. Any updates? Cassie asked. Nope. We haven't had to meet with Monica all week, so there's been nothing to report. Cassie's face formed a perfect pout. Boring. Ellie pulled her purse handle higher on her shoulder. Are you going to the company skate tonight? Cassie asked. She had been tempted to say, you mean Cassie's skate night? But she swallowed the quip. I wasn't planning on it. Oh, come on, it'll be fun, Cassie said, her smile wide. Maybe, Ellie answered noncommittally. I've got to run. She left Cassie with a wave and left for her meeting. Brady excused himself from this meeting due to some other work responsibilities, but Ellie felt like she could handle it, and she had been right. The executives were as friendly as one would expect for a board of people who ran a charity to help less fortunate children, and they all came to the same conclusions easily regarding the percentage of the proceeds that would go straight to their foundation and the percent that would go to the event facilities and catering. It was heavily in the charity's favor, but that was as it should be, in Ellie's opinion. She left for home after the meeting and paused in the doorway to her apartment. There was a yellow Volkswagen parked on the street. Mom. Climbing the stairs with resignation, Ellie let herself into her apartment and registered the sound of her mother's hollow laughter. Hi, Mom, she sang, effectively silencing the laughter in the kitchen. She moved forward to find Kayla and her mother sitting at the kitchen table with dirty plates in front of them. Hi, Ellie. How good to see you, sweetheart. Did you ever get the fruitcake recipe I left with Kayla? Yes, she said, but I'm not going to that family party, so there's no need for me to make it. Besides, Grandma had given her a copy of the recipe herself years ago. Mom stood, crossing the room to stand before Ellie. She pulled her into a hug, which Ellie barely participated in. Don't talk such nonsense. You know your cousins would love to see you. I don't want to drive clear to Sacramento for a family party full of people I don't really know. I'm swamped at work, and I've got too much going on here. In fact, she said, disentangling herself from her mother's grip, I've got a work thing tonight, so I should probably clean up and head out. Ellie took herself to her room and shut the door, quickly changing her clothes to something more flexible. 
She grabbed her coat, scarf, and hat and went back out to the living room. Her mom had reseated herself at the table beside Kayla, and Ellie gave them a bright smile. I guess I'll see you later. Half-hearted goodbyes trailed Ellie out the door, and she whipped out her phone and sent Brady a text as she stepped out onto the sidewalk. Are you going ice skating tonight? Because I am, and it should be loads of fun. Ellie hopped onto a bus ride to Union Square, ignoring the faint thread of unease which slithered into her abdomen. She hadn't meant to be rude to her mom, of course, but it was a defense mechanism. The woman hadn't raised her anyway, her grandparents had. And when both of them passed away a few years before, and her mom miraculously showed up again and wanted to be part of her life, well, to say she was hesitant to dive in headfirst was an understatement. The only relationship she'd had with either of her parents was as go-between for them when she was a teenager, until she finally put a stop to it. But was it wrong of her to keep putting the woman off? At some point, she needed to give her a chance, right? Just maybe not at Christmas time. The Union Square stop came and Ellie got off the bus, crossing the road toward the square and mounting the steps to better see the enormous tree. There was a group forming near the skating rink located near the tree, and Ellie noticed Cassie right away standing at the rear with her arms strung through a man's. Approaching them, she looked the man over, but she had no idea who he was. He was tall, with his hands slung in his pockets and his hair in need of a trim, but his beard was immaculate. He resembled a logger, if they still existed, with his red and black checkered shirt. And he was the last guy in the world she would have imagined to be Cassie's boyfriend. If she'd guessed, she'd have paired the tall, chic blonde with the tall, debonair businessman. And rich. She would have pegged him as rich. Hey, Ellie! Cassie greeted, waving her over. Come meet my boyfriend, James! He's amazing, am I right? Ellie exchanged a smile with James and introduced herself. Skates are over there, Cassie said, indicating the booth to their right. Ellie thanked her and went to rent some ice skates. She never particularly loved ice skating. It wasn't a sport for the clumsy, of course, but she could have fun with a group from work. Anything beat making small talk with her mom. Once she'd acquired skates and sat on a bench to lace them up, she saw a few more people she recognized from work. She had been hoping Zane would show up, but she hadn't seen him yet. And despite her text to Brady, she hadn't seen... Mind if I sit here? Ellie's heart began to beat in rapid succession as she looked up and found Brady standing behind the bench, a pair of black ice skates hanging from his hand. Not at all, she said, moving her bag to the floor. You didn't tell me you like to ice skate? I don't, he said. But my friend invited me, so here I am. Was she the friend? His facetious smile indicated that he meant her, but she didn't love being referred to as simply his friend. They finished lacing their skates and then stood awkwardly, balancing precariously as they walked to the rink. Ellie stepped onto the ice first, and she found her balance coming back to her. The familiar motions of skating were easy to recall, and as soon as she got moving and found her rhythm, she was gliding across the ice with ease. She waved to a few women from the office and to Cassie, who was hand-in-hand -hand with James, both skating like they'd been doing it their entire lives. When she made it back around to the entrance, she found Brady holding onto the edge of the rink, his feet slipping on the ice. Come on, she said through a laugh. You've got to just go for it. It's so much easier that way. He did not look amused. I don't know why I agreed to this. It's not one of my strengths. It's okay to do things that you aren't perfect at sometimes. It's fun. He didn't look convinced. She wanted to reach for his hand, but they were surrounded by coworkers, and it probably wasn't a good idea to be seen that comfortable with one another. Come on, she urged. Just try it. Huffing out a cloud of breath, Brady slowly released the edge of the rink. His strides started out very small, but grew in length as he became more comfortable on the ice. By the time they began their second turn around the rink, Brady was moving along at a decent pace, and Ellie clapped her hands together. Good job, she said, skating beside him with ease. How do you make it look so easy? He asked. Ellie sped up and skated a full circle around Brady before returning to his side. I have no idea what you're talking about. Very funny. Cassie skated past them again and Brady leaned closer. Who's the guy? James, she informed him. Cassie's boyfriend. That's funny. For someone who doesn't know how to stop talking about other people's drama, she really keeps a tight lid on her own. Huh. Ellie hadn't considered that before, but it was true. They chatted at least once a day, usually more than once, and Cassie had never once talked about her own boyfriend, or her personal life at all, for that matter. 
Maybe she really did know how to keep quiet about things which were important, given the secret she knew about Ellie and Brady's fake relationship. That was a very good sign. They passed a woman clutching the side of the rink, her hair bright red and curly and her cheeks rosy. Hello, Bridget, Brady called to her as they approached. Mr. Gaines' secretary waved back at them as they passed. They skated near one another for another twenty minutes before they decided to call it quits and left the rink, along with a large majority of their Harvard Allen co-workers. Who's up for hot chocolate? Cassie asked the group they stood in. The general consensus was yes. The group changed back into their own shoes, gathered together their things, and set off for the coffee shop down the street. Ellie and Brady took up the rear, careful not to walk too closely to one another. Did we pull you away from any grand plans this evening? Ellie asked. Brady chuckled. If takeout in front of the TV is grand, then yes, you pulled me away from a really important evening at home alone. Ellie had to smile to herself that it was her text that brought him out to a work function. He had mentioned that a friend invited him, but that could have been someone else and Ellie. Was it terrible that she was overly pleased with the idea that she had influenced his plans for the evening? If nothing else, it meant that Brady chose her over a chill night at home. What about you? Brady asked, causing her to pause on the sidewalk. She quickly righted herself and caught up to him. My mom stopped by to remind me about the family party next week, but I can't go to it anyway. Oh, bummer. I was going to offer my services if you needed them. Ellie pretended to consider the idea. Yeah, sorry, I don't have any crazy exes that I need to be guarded from. I'm pretty good at just saying no. That doesn't surprise me one bit, he said. The gala is one short week away. Do you feel ready? I think so. Do you have your ornament yet? No, Brady said. I didn't even think of it, to be honest. I guess we'll be attending too, though, right? So why not participate? Exactly. I've chosen mine already. I saw it in a little shop walking home from work the other day and fell in love with it. She cast him a sidelong glance. Actually, I might have to hide mine among the branches so I can take it back home with me. There should be a rule against that, Brady said. But there isn't. I proofed the invitation so I would know. They approached the coffee shop and Brady held the door for her. When Ellie stepped into the warmth, followed directly by Brady, she was fairly sure nothing in the world could ruin her Christmas holiday at this point, fake relationship or otherwise. Chapter 17 Brady was in major trouble. Not just a little trouble, but huge, huge trouble. He sat at his desk the day before the gala and watched Ellie walk across the glass bridge outside the design room and then disappear around the corner toward her desk. The smile on her face as she walked was contagious, and he felt his lips turning up in accordance with hers. He needed the light that she exuded in his life. She was so calm and joyful and had no idea that anyone was observing her. She enjoyed old movies and everything Christmas, and was the type of thoughtful person who noticed when others were in need and silently acted to right their wrongs, like she'd done for grandmother. She was exactly the type of woman he wanted to be his real girlfriend. But did she feel the same? He was fairly sure she felt the electricity between them during their mistletoe kiss, but that was over a week ago and had yet to be repeated. Maybe it would be wise for him to hang mistletoe about the office, just in case they happened under it at the same time. What could go wrong with that scenario? Well, HR would have a field day for one. Chuckling over the absurdity, Brady sat back in his chair and formulated a plan. He wouldn't worry about going to HR until he'd gotten a confirmation from her. Somehow, he needed to get to the bottom of what Ellie was doing for the fake relationship and what was coming from her heart. Zane crossed the bridge next, and Brady's stomach constricted. He'd sent the images off to Gaines, but never bothered telling Zane. He didn't want to get the guy's hopes up in case Gaines chose to go a different direction. But was it better for Zane to imagine Brady as the worst, most self-consumed boss of all time? Because he probably felt exactly that way. He nodded his head toward Zane when he came into the room and got a perfunctory nod in return. What was taking Gaines so long to make his decision? Brady hadn't seen the rest of the designs for Bear Mobile, but he knew Zane's was probably in the final round of options. It was good. Blowing out a gust of air, Brady jumped when the door opened and Ellie came inside. Are you ready? She asked. Was his stare as blank as he felt? He had no idea what he was supposed to be ready for. The museum? She prompted. Are we going over there today? Yes, Ellie said with a nod. We've got to direct the setup, or I can just go alone if you think you've got too much going on here. She glanced around the nearly empty office. 
Tomorrow was Christmas Eve, and a lot of employees had opted to take the day off. No, I'm ready. Just give me five minutes to close everything up here. No problem. Ellie turned directly for Zane, pulling out a chair beside him at the large conference table and greeting him warmly. Brady was not a man prone to jealousy, but watching her interact so easily with another guy was not easy for him. So, any news? Ellie asked quietly, sitting beside Zane at the vast table. Nothing, he said with a shake of his head. I didn't give up, but I really can only ask him so many times. Yeah, I don't blame you. Ellie sat back in the chair, drawing her eyebrows together in concentration. I did say something to him, but we're just working on the gala together. I don't have any pull there. It's not your problem, Zane said. I'm probably just being too sensitive about the whole thing. I just thought I had something good this time. And you do. Someone will recognize your talent. Just don't give up. Are you ready? Brady asked, approaching their table. Ellie stood. Yep. You can take off for the day if you want, Zane. Brady said. He glanced up at his boss and nodded. Great. Well, shall we? Brady's eyebrows were lifted and his mouth set in a firm line. Ellie could cut the tension between the men with a plastic knife. It was clear Brady felt bad about his actions or he wouldn't be acting so weird. Maybe if she just asked him one last time. Merry Christmas, Zane, she called as they left the room. Merry Christmas, he called back. Silence sat between them as they left the building and got into a cab. She couldn't place exactly what was going on, but there was tension between them, and Ellie had not felt it the day before. Once the cab pulled to a stop, she got out and faced him on the sidewalk in front of the museum. Hey, what's going on? Things seem weird. Nothing, he said immediately. I've just been contemplative. She didn't know if she believed him, but she let it go. Let's go decorate a museum, she said, trying to infuse her words with enthusiasm. And no Scrooge is allowed. A small smile broke out on his lips. There we go, Ellie said, feeling successful. Come on, we've got a tree to put together. Again? Brady said with mock annoyance. Yeah, again. Monica stood near the entrance, a clipboard in her hand, and the end of her pen resting against her lips. I think over there in that general area, she said, waving her pen like a wand. A couple of men hefted up a large tree and began carrying it to the corner of the room. Hey, wait a second, please, Ellie called, stepping forward. Monica, what's going on over there? I was under the impression we were putting the tree in the center of the room. I just think it'll look nice beside those tall windows. Ellie drew in a breath for patience and then said, I think we should stick to the original plan. If we shift something now, then we'll have to shift everything, and that seems like a lot of work. Monica's eyes narrowed slightly. Fine, whatever. She turned her attention to the workers with the tree. The center of the room, please. Thanks, Monica, Ellie said. I think it just makes it too complicated to make changes this close to the event. I'll oversee the tables, Monica said. They should be here any minute. And I can begin creating the table settings. Where is everything? Monica pointed out the room where the decorations were, and Ellie took off, Brady close behind her. Did you end up finding an ornament? Ellie asked as she let herself into the room and began rummaging through boxes to inventory what they had. I did he said. I ordered it online and it arrived yesterday. What did you choose? Brady shook his head. Nope. You're going to have to wait. I want to see if you'll be able to figure out mine without any help. No pressure or anything. Brady chuckled. On the contrary, tons of pressure. Chapter 18 Her dress was hanging on the back of the door, and her heels were set out on the chair beside them with her purse containing the ornament she had bought in that tiny store, it was exactly like those sweet little cottages Beverly had in her tiny Christmas village, and the moment Ellie had laid eyes on it, she knew it was perfect for the gifting tree. She pulled her gaze back to the mirror, pinning the last few curls into place in the low gathered updo. Pulling out her mascara, she added an extra layer to her eyelashes, and then sat back and observed her work. She'd spent ten times the amount of time on her appearance than she usually did, and she hoped it was sufficient. Pulling on the long, powder blue dress, she slipped on her silver heels and surveyed the look in the long mirror against her door. When she'd chosen the dress originally, she'd been reminded of a snowflake. Now she wondered if she had gone too fancy with her whole look that evening. Snatching up her purse, Ellie left her room. Hey, Kayla said, halting her in the hall, her voice low and her dark eyes serious. I was just coming to get you. Your mom's here. Why? Kayla shrugged. She doesn't look happy. Ellie groaned. 
Fine, I'll handle this. Stepping into their small living room, Ellie found her mom pacing on the carpet in front of the TV. Her hair was scraped back into a ponytail, the bags under her eyes evidence of a lack of sleep. When she noticed Ellie, she paused, pointing her finger at her daughter. I need to speak to you, and this cannot wait. Can we make it quick? I'm on my way out. Mom scoffed. Yes, I can make it quick. I'm sorry that I haven't been the best mom, but how long are you planning to hold it over my head? I've been trying ever since your grandma died to step in and be there for you, and all you do is push me away. Did the woman not hear herself? She didn't even bother to be a parent until after the woman who raised Ellie had passed away. Mom lifted her hands in surrender. I know, I should have been better, but I didn't realize how badly I messed up until then. Why can't you let me make it right? Ellie stood in a long, shiny gown in the middle of her small apartment and stared at her mother. Why didn't she just give the woman a chance? Well, that answer was clear. She wanted justice. She wanted to punish her mother the way she'd been punished her whole life with a lack of relationship, when the only time her mom called her was to ask questions about her dad. It had been heartbreaking as a teenager, but that was many years ago now. Now, a woman stood in front of her with the desire to make things right. I am on my way to a work event, Mom, she said, shaking her head. I'm hearing everything you're saying, but I need a minute to think. You've had three years, and you hurt me for the twenty before that, so I think I deserve a little bit of time. They faced off, the couch sitting in between them as though it was a barrier. Mom's breath was coming in heaves, and Ellie was proud of herself for remaining so calm. I know it's a long drive for you, Ellie said, but can you come back tomorrow? Her mom swallowed, nodding slowly, her eyes looking mistrustful. I can? Great. Then I'll come up with a Christmas dinner and maybe we can just talk. Her mom's sudden, hopeful expression was almost heartbreaking. Instead, she chose to see the potential in it, while simultaneously guarding herself. And who was she kidding? She had an entire Christmas dinner planned for herself anyway since Kayla was going to her parents' house. She could easily stretch it for two people. She walked her mom to the door and waved as she descended the steps, closing the door behind her. Kayla's voice sounded behind her. That was calm. Yeah, I think I need to decide how I want to proceed here. But my mom made a valid point and I'm going to talk to her tomorrow. I just don't have the brain capacity to tackle it right this second. Of course not. You're running a gala tonight for all of the major socialites and bigwigs of San Francisco. Shouldn't you get moving? She crossed the room and pulled Kayla into a hug. Thanks for your support. I've got your back. I know. Are you heading to your parents' house now? Merry Christmas. Kayla pulled back. I've put your gift under the tree. Don't you dare open it until tomorrow. You know I won't. Ellie stepped away and checked her purse for her phone. She pulled on her coat and made it to the door. Turning back, she said, And yours is hidden in your overnight bag. Yeah, I saw it, Kayla said unrepentantly. And it is gorgeous. She flashed her wrist to showcase the new watch Ellie had chosen for her. Ellie rolled her eyes dramatically, but sent her friend a smile before she left the house. Glad you love it, she called just before she shut the door. Slipping her phone out of her pocket, she opened her ride app and clicked the button to send for a ride. Within two minutes, a car was pulling up in front of her house, and she hopped in the back seat and made sure her dress was all the way in before closing the door. Clouds had slowly rolled in all afternoon. Ellie just hoped the rain would leave off until the party ended and all of her guests were safely home. The driver led her out directly in front of the museum, and she hurried inside, locating the coat check and dropping off her coat and purse with the museum employee. Monica was already there with the clipboard, talking to some waitresses, so Ellie began the rounds double-checking the tables in the dining area and the cocktail tables in the mingling area to assure herself everything was set up accurately. Next year, she was going to strongly urge Mr. Gaines to hire professional party planners. They existed for a reason. But for being an intern, she felt like she'd done a pretty good job. Guests began arriving, and the strings ensemble they'd hired started playing Jingle Bells. After Ellie made the rounds, she stopped at the oversized Christmas tree and looked at the ornaments people had hung already. I think I'll take that little Santa if no one gets to it first, an older woman was saying behind her. Isn't that just the cutest little thing? Ellie had to smile to herself. The gifting tree was bound to be a success among the patrons. She turned for the coat check to retrieve her own little cottage ornament and paused to wait for the employee to finish helping another guest. 
By the time Ellie retrieved her ornament to hang on the tree, there was a line of attendees out the door waiting to get inside. Clipping across the floor at a healthy pace, Ellie convinced herself she would not trip in the two tall heels and made it to the tree safely. She found a branch nestled in the tree a little more near a column and placed the cottage there. It wasn't as though she was trying to hide it exactly, but if she was able to take home her own ornament, she wouldn't be too sad about it. They'd placed about 30 ornaments on the tree yesterday for those who might have forgotten to bring one, and she would be happy with any of those too. Turning to watch the door, Ellie came face to face with Monica. It was inevitable to greet her now, not unless Ellie chose to slip under the Christmas tree Grinch style, which actually had potential with the silkiness of her dress. Ellie pasted a smile on her face, which was easily done with the Grinch imagery fresh in her mind. Everything looks lovely. I really pulled it all together, didn't I? Monica said, glancing around with a self-satisfied smile. Ellie chose not to respond to that. She looked around and found Mr. Gaines standing beside a regally dressed woman with white hair. I'm going to check in with some co-workers, Ellie said by way of excuse. She crossed to the couple and paused. Mr. Gaines didn't seem to recognize her, or perhaps he was simply blanking on her name. But the woman with him smiled at her with welcoming grace. Hello, Mr. Gaines. I hope you enjoy yourself this evening. We have canopies in this part of the room, and the tree is just over there if you brought an ornament to hang. I did, Mrs. Gaines said, holding out a small white deer on a delicate gold thread. Her ornament matched the decor of the party effortlessly. How lovely. And you are Mrs. Gaines, I presume? The woman nodded. I'm Ellie Shaw. I'm an intern at Harvard Allen Design. I'm so pleased to meet you. She waited for Mr. Gaines to explain that the entire gala was Ellie's brainchild, but since he probably didn't even remember her name, he likely didn't realize she had put so much effort into it. And I as well, Mrs. Gaines said, before excusing herself to hang her ornament. Ellie spent the next thirty minutes slowly circling the crowds, watching for Brady and feeling disappointed every time the door opened and he didn't step inside. A hand reached out and grabbed her arm, and she turned to find Cassie standing in a long green dress. She wore large diamond earrings and looked like she belonged. Good job, she said. Lowering her voice to a whisper, she asked, Where's your boyfriend? I don't know, Ellie said. And we need him to begin the next portion of the evening. I did see him a minute ago, but then he disappeared. Ellie let out a breath. Well, at least he was here. Hey, she said. Where's your boyfriend? Right here, Cassie said casually with a flick of her wrist. Ellie noticed the man just behind them with the immaculate beard. It was Logger James in a tux, and he looked completely transformed. Her eyebrows lifted. He's the one who got me in here. You think Gaines lets all of his secretaries into the gala? Cassie asked. James is rich. Ah, so Ellie had been right about that one thing. Cassie did date a guy with money. They were nearing the time to lead everyone into dinner and begin the ceremony with the board members of Kids After School, and she was growing anxious. I better go find Brady. Had something come up and he had to go? She'd sent him a text message twenty minutes before, but it had gone unanswered. Circling the outskirts of the room slowly, Ellie paused beside a column and waited. She couldn't find Monica now either, and her heart began racing. She didn't mind handling everything behind the scenes, but she did not want to be forced to announce the amount of money they'd fundraised through ticket sales and donations, and she certainly did not want to invite the museum founder and Mr. Gaines up to the podium to deliver their speeches. Monica had asked for the job of leading the ceremony, and Ellie had gladly agreed to it. Perhaps Monica had just gone upstairs. She started toward the elevators and was no more than ten feet from their doors when she heard a small ding and the doors opened. And then Ellie had a perfect view of Brady and Monica, wrapped in an embrace and kissing with the light of the elevator creating a heavenly halo around them. She stood rooted to the spot, frozen by disgust and hurt. Mechanically, Ellie spun away from the scene and began walking toward the exit. They could have each other, and this gala too. Sneaking into the coat check, she grabbed her coat and purse and made it to the door. A moment's hesitation caused Ellie to pause, considering the little cottage ornament she had left on the tree. She was tempted to turn back for it, but tears had already begun to gather in her eyes. Brady's voice called out, Ellie, wait! But she couldn't. She didn't want to hear his excuses. She'd heard so many times how difficult it was for him to resist Monica, and in the stunning red dress Monica was wearing this evening, Ellie really wasn't surprised he'd caved. Ellie crossed the distance to the doors and pushed them open. Of course it would be raining now. 
Groaning loudly, she pulled on her coat and stepped down the stairs toward the street, getting out her phone to call for a ride. The closest one was five minutes away. Of course. Ellie, wait, Brady said, running down the stairs as he opened an umbrella. He held it over her, stepping close enough to be covered as well. She stepped out into the rain. Don't be ridiculous, Ellie. Obviously, I can explain that. He stepped closer again, and she stepped from the umbrella once more. She was being ridiculous, but she didn't care. She didn't want to breathe the same air as Brady, much less listen to his explanation. As far as she was concerned, things between them were over. Chapter 19 Fine, you stay under the umbrella and I'll stand in the rain, Brady said, exasperated by her refusal to speak more than her constant stepping back. He held the umbrella over Ellie's head by extending his arm and she stayed put but it was growing difficult to see with the deluge pouring down his face. He slicked the water away with one hand long enough to see Ellie's frustrated glare. But then he felt her hand push the umbrella back over his head as she stepped closer. She was so close he could see the fire in her eyes, and he didn't blame her. He'd hate himself too if their roles were reversed. It was mistletoe, he began. Stupidly, apparently, for Ellie merely lifted her eyebrows, her frown growing more pronounced. So you just kiss anyone who happens to stand under the mistletoe beside you? No, I mean, yes, it seems that way, but I didn't kiss her, Ellie. I watched it happen, Brady, and it wasn't a short kiss. He shook his head. I know, but it wasn't my fault. Monica took me upstairs to get the boxes of umbrellas she'd ordered in case of rain. On our way back down, she mentioned the mistletoe, and then the next thing I knew, she was kissing me. I panicked. I didn't even realize what was happening. And as soon as I broke the kiss, she smiled at me so slyly. I realized how she had orchestrated the situation. Ellie merely shook her head. I don't know if I can believe you, Brady. You've been telling me for weeks that you don't know how to refuse her. How can I believe you ended it? Trust me, he said with as much fire as he possessed. I don't have feelings for her anymore. They've all been snuffed out by a new fire in my heart, and it belongs to you. Ellie looked down at the ground, and he wanted to pull her into his arms, but he could see she was hesitant. "'You finish the gala and the ceremony and everything,' she said. "'I'll see you at work.' But then he wouldn't be able to give her the ornament, or dance with her in the museum, or stare at her in that exquisite dress. "'Please don't go, Ellie.' She laughed, but the sound was without humor, and it wrecked him. "'I'm not going back in there looking like a drowned cat.' Her phone buzzed, and she glanced down at it. My ride's here. I've got to go. Brady watched her leave. When her car pulled onto the street and out of view, he dropped his head, scrubbing the water from his face. He didn't know how he was going to manage it, but he needed to figure out a way to make things right. When Ellie got home, she slipped out of the dress and into the shower, allowing the hot water to wash away the extra makeup and hairspray she'd worn. Turning on White Christmas, Ellie shut off all the lights in the apartment except for the Christmas tree and donned her warmest pajamas and fuzzy socks. Popping a bag of popcorn, she snuggled onto the sofa and watched her favorite Christmas movie, doing her best not to feel sad about the evening's turn of events. Brady made a valid point, and Ellie could see how Monica would have pushed him into exactly that scenario. It was probably icing on Monica's cake that Ellie had been standing in front of the elevator right when the doors opened. But she had to let it go. When she had stepped close to Brady under the umbrella, she had seen the sincerity in his eyes and could feel that he'd been telling her the truth. But there was still no way she was returning to the gala soaked through. It would be easier to approach him at work after Christmas with some distance and time between them, where she could treat him like a co-worker and not like her fake boyfriend anymore. Ding dong. The doorbell caused her to jump and she turned to face it. Normally, she would expect it to be her mother, but since that had already happened a few hours before, she had no idea who it could be. It certainly wasn't Brady, as much as her rebellious heart wished that was the case. There was no way the gala was over yet. Plodding to the door, she peeked through the hole and drew a sharp intake of breath. Opening the door slowly, she asked, "'Why are you here?' Brady's contrite smile made her heart melt at once. "'I found your ornament on the tree,' he said, dipping his head slightly." His eyes implored her with their sincerity. The moment I saw it, I realized how I felt about you. Ellie watched as he fished it out of his pocket and raised the small cottage on a string. Ellie, I realize how angry you must be, and I will respect that and give you space for as long as you need it. But please, please tell me you will forgive me. Please say we can begin again. 
I think you just mean begin. His eyebrows drew together and she couldn't help but reach for the ornament. He pulled his hands back. I chose this one. I'm keeping it. What about me? He reached into his pocket and pulled out a tiny pair of white ice skates. They made me think of you. I wanted to hold your hand so badly that whole evening, but I knew we had to keep our distance and it nearly killed me. He stepped closer, placing the ice skate ornament in her palm. Lowering his voice, he asked, Please. She held his gaze. I don't want any more secrets. Me neither, he agreed. Monday morning, we can go straight to HR and sign one of those inner office relationship forms. We probably won't be able to head up projects together, but that's just a small disadvantage. And what are the advantages? Ellie asked. The small smile which curled on Brady's lips was delicious, and she realized that kissing him would certainly be one of them. Well, for one, he said, reaching for her hand, I'll be able to hold your hand whenever I want. Leveling her with a look, he lowered his voice. What do you say? Ellie sighed, feigning irritation. Fine, Brady, I'll forgive you, but don't let me ever catch you kissing Monica again. His smile grew. Funny story, actually. Right before we went on stage to start the ceremony, I told her how I felt about you and how angry I was that she had used me like that. And she actually apologized. Ellie didn't know whether to believe him or not. I know, it was crazy, and she'll probably act like it never happened. But she did say she was sorry. Oh, how I would have paid good money to hear that. Brady lowered his voice. How about you let me in, and I can recount the story for you play by play. She glanced over her shoulder at the idyllic Christmas Eve she was enjoying. I'm watching White Christmas, she said in a warning tone. Bring it on, he answered with a laugh. Ellie pulled him inside by the hand and shut the door behind him. His eyes grew dark and serious and his voice low. Ellie, I promise that if you take me back, I will never make you regret it. Impossible, he pulled back. Why? Because I can't take you back, just like we can't begin again. That relationship was fake. If we do this, it'll be real. Then let's do this for real. He slid his hands around her neck and pulled her close, kissing her with warmth and determination. When Ellie finally pulled away, she was dazed and content. I guess this means you'll drive me up to Beverly's house on New Year's Day to take down her Christmas decorations? He looked at her, uncertainty in his eyes. Yeah, of course. Ellie moved over to the sofa and dropped on the couch. Phew, I've been wondering how I was going to get there. Epilogue, one year later. The entire family was gathering in the dining room as Shelby brought out trays of Italian food and Sharon carried in her version of cranberry sauce. Despite all the time Brady's mom had spent watching the Food Network, it still hadn't turned out exactly like it had when she'd watched it on TV. But she chose to put it on the table anyway, just in case anyone wanted to try it. Plain. Hey. Brady said, whispering into Ellie's ear before she could take a seat. Come here a second. I want to show you something. He took her by the hand and led her from the dining room and into the small family room. They'd showed up at Beverly's house earlier in the day to have all of her Christmas decorations set up, and with just the lights on the tree and the village lit, the room felt magical. Did you bring something to add to the village? Ellie asked, wondering why Brady was staring at it for so long. Maybe we can get a miniature bare mobile building to honor Zane's project. I can't believe how stunning it turned out. He finally turned his attention back to her. Yeah, that's exactly what Grandmother wants in her village. Taking her hand in both of his, his eyes grew serious and he dropped to one knee. Butterflies hummed inside her body as she realized what was happening. It was in this house, exactly one year ago, that I realized how amazing and thoughtful you are. I knew in that moment that my life was changing for the better, and I have you to thank. My darling Ellie... Would you please do me the honor of agreeing to be my wife? Tears slipped down her cheeks as she gazed at the man who loved her unconditionally. Nodding because she could not open her mouth to speak, she accepted his proposal. Brady opened the ring box in his pocket and pulled out a beautiful diamond ring, sliding it onto her finger. I don't know how I was ever so blessed to have you in my life. You were trying to escape the clutches of your crazy ex-girlfriend, remember? She said through tears and laughter. Brady shook his head, the smile growing on his lips. He rose and kissed her. Thank you, he whispered. The pleasure is mine. Ellie wiped the tears from her face. Examining her ring, she said, You know my mom is going to want to plan this whole thing now. Maybe we should just elope, he said, and Ellie was pretty sure he meant it. 
I've been pretty good at setting boundaries lately. I think we can come to a healthy compromise. She should be involved in the wedding. And what's weird is that I want her to be. Brady lifted her hand to look at the ring, his countenance positively glowing. I'm glad. Can we go tell everyone now? Wait, Ellie said. Let me do one thing first. She led the way out of the room and into the dining room where the family was still trying to get dinner situated and everyone into their seats. Moving to the end of the table where Beverly patiently sat, Ellie took the older woman's hand in her own and squeezed. Merry Christmas, Beverly. It only took a moment for Beverly to feel the difference on her finger, and her eyes glistened suspiciously. It is a Merry Christmas indeed. This has been his stand-in holiday girlfriend, Christmas in the City. Written by Casey Stockton. Narrated by Elizabeth Eliason. Copyright 2019 by Casey Stockton. Production copyright by Casey Stockton. Hi, it's Casey Stockton. Thanks for listening to my audiobook. If you enjoyed this story, then please like or comment on the video. And if you'd like to know when more audiobooks are coming, then go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Thanks, guys, and happy reading.